our second part of the day uh, till Dr. Vannon comes. There were a couple of questions left from the last session. Um, uh, one was about the PAD that uh, uh, how much of the anticoagulant should be given, still not in the guidelines, so cannot do it. You have to wait for the FDA and all those approvals. Uh, secondly, where is the evidence that the antiplatelets do well? Look at the COMPASS study. Uh, platelets alone versus uh, and, and, and the novel anticoagulants versus both of them, you'll clearly see that combination does better than that. And the reason is, what is the source of the emboli or embolic showers? That's probably aorta, probably iliacs, probably femorals, probably popliteal. So any one of those areas are uh, 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 responsible for that, and there you need platelets, and then you need the anticoagulant. So it has to be a combination eventually. So let us see uh, when we'll have more of a prospective data here. We will, we will know more. So now Dr. Vannon is here. Dr. Vannon and I go long, and uh, we've been friends for a long. We have worked together, written together, uh, outstanding echocardiographer, outstanding echocardiographer, and uh, he comes to you with uh, the imaging of aortic stenosis from low flow to low gradient and low output. Uh, he is the director of uh, imaging center as well as of the VAL program and VAL institute at Piedmont in Atlanta and has lectured extensively on this and uh, very active in the American Society of Echocardiography. Dr. Vannon, and the most important thing is he's one of the most eloquent teachers uh, that I have uh, heard when it comes to echocardiography. Dr. Vannon. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for the honor and the privilege to be here. Um, Aortic stenosis is an interesting disease. Everything we think we are learning now, we knew before, and everything we knew before, we did not know as much as we wanted to know. So there's really a, um, a big awakening in aortic stenosis, and I think part of it is driven by the evolution of transcatheter therapies. There's no question about it. So it behooves on us to then understand this disease. Uh, it is not what we think it used to be in the sense that we all thought about aortic stenosis in a way that famous curve where we had the asymptomatic period and then we had the symptomatic period during which uh, the mortality was very high. What I wanted to, you, uh, to show you today is that it comes in many forms. It's not the classic variety all the time. So hopefully this would be of some practical value for all of you. Here we see um, a calcified aortic valve, restricted motion, and similarly here in this view, you see a calcified restricted aortic valve. Left ventricular function that is completely normal, measured biplane ejection fraction is 73%. This is your classic variety, restricted valve, calcified aortic valve, plus normal left ventricular ejection fraction. This is an 87-year-old lady and all of these parameters are important to look at. For those of you who are dealing with aortic stenosis, these are numbers not to be foo-fooed, but to be looked at very carefully because ultimately, when you look at the overall diagnosis of these patients, all of these numbers come into play. This is something we did not do diligently before. When we look at the hemodynamics, these are selected hemodynamics from the same patient, here is the LVOT diameter from which we get stroke volume, from where we get stroke volume index. Stroke volume index is your indicator of flow, not ejection fraction. So if you're interested in flow conditions, always think about stroke volume, not about ejection fraction. And so this number becomes critical. The magic number here is 35. If you have a stroke volume index based on this calculation, based on LVOT diameter, and the VTI of the LVOT signal, which is less than 35, you're dealing with a low flow condition. Why is that important? Because any gradient you're going to get is critically dependent on this number. So if you have low flow, you're going to have a low gradient. In this particular patient, 
the stroke volume index is normal. So this is the first important step. The valve is abnormal, the ejection fraction is normal, and the stroke volume index is normal. Now we should have numbers on the aortic valve by Doppler which should be consistent with severe aortic stenosis. If it's not, then we've got to explain that discrepancy. So you can see here one of the things that we have been, this is time honored, this is nothing new, and that is from one apical window you get a peak velocity of 3.4, a mean gradient of 28, and a calculated aortic valve area of 1.1, but everything about this valve tells us this is not a valve area of 1.1. So visual inspection of the valve is important. Then, as we have taught in echocardiography, you go for other windows where you try to find the peak velocity. This is from the right parasternal, 3.7. Then when you go to suprasternal, you get what is the real peak velocity, which is 4.1, a mean gradient of 38, and a calculated aortic value of uh, 0.75 centimeters squared. Clearly severe aortic stenosis. The message of this case is twofold. Look at these numbers, stroke volume index is key, look at ejection fraction, look at the valve, and make sure you're getting the peak velocity in Doppler, often forgotten, because this looks like a good Doppler profile. And it's not, even visually it is not, because you can see these velocities are going the opposite direction, at the same time these are going in this direction. That means your Doppler beam is not aligned, not improbable in the population we do towers on. This is not uncommon at all. In the garden variety, 55, 60 year old with severe aortic stenosis, this is not a big issue. But when you get to 80, the tortuous aorta makes it very difficult to align your Doppler to get the peak velocity right. So in this patient, classically defined as normal EF, normal flow, high gradient, the mean gradient was 40. So this patient now belongs to this category, normal EF, normal flow, high gradient, severe ES the classic aortic stenosis that we've all been taught. This is how we now report our aortic stenosis. This is important because every category has a different prognostic value. The important message here is for those of who do echocardiography is to make sure that we try every window to get the highest velocity and not depend on just the four chamber view or just one apical. So we in good labs would do all of these windows this is your suprasternal, this is even supraclavicular. There is nothing that stops you from doing that. And here, left parasternal and right parasternal, because the aorta sometimes goes horizontal, you have to align this beam. Staying at the apex will never get you the peak velocity. How common is this issue in the contemporary population? If you look at this data from Mayo Clinic, up to 60% of the patients get peak velocities from a non-apical window. Very important piece of data for the contemporary population because we are now dealing with 80-year-olds and older patients that have a very different kind of um, aortic root to left ventricular angle than the 60-year-old with severe aortic stenosis. And it results in misclassification aorta in about a quarter of the patients, not an insignificant number of patients. So this message here is even in classic aortic stenosis to look at all the Doppler windows. Here is another lady, body surface area of 1.57, that means relatively small, um, hypertensive, normal left ventricular function with an ejection fraction of 61%. The valve is calcified. It is restricted both in the short axis and in the long axis. And now when you look at her numbers, we want to be next interested in stroke volume index. The stroke volume index is normal, greater than 35 and we get a peak velocity of 4.9 from the apical window with a mean gradient of 62, very high, and a calculated aortic value of 0.5. We could stop here. We could stop here and said, I've got all the numbers that are consistent with severe aortic stenosis. But the value of doing non-apical windows, even in these patients where the numbers are consistent, is because of this number right here. If you go to the suprasternal, you get a peak velocity of six meters per second with a mean gradient of 89. Six meters per second, anything over five meters per second, those are high risk substrates. 
So even when you get four, four and a half meters per second, it is worth looking for five meters and above because those patients are a class one indication, even if asymptomatic for aortic valve replacement because those are high risk substrates. So the idea that we stop it here is not a good one. In good clinical practice, you're always looking for numbers uh, that are higher than what you think you get from the apical window. Another uh, gentleman here, um, calcified valve, restricted valve, here in the apical window, you get a peak velocity of 4.6, and you see on the, paras on the suprasternal, you get a peak velocity of 5.1. That puts this patient in a different category altogether. This, if this patient was asymptomatic with this velocity, one would argue that you should either do an exercise test to induce symptoms if there's ambiguous symptoms, or truly follow up these patients, at least based on current guidelines. But when you hit five meters per second, that becomes a trigger for intervention, even if the patient is asymptomatic. The value of doing um, non-apical windows. And here is the evidence, AVR is reasonable um, when the aortic velocity of five meters per second or greater, or a mean pressure gradient of 60 in the current guidelines. And I'm going to show you some data how, why this is becoming very important. Here is a more recent data, right? That guidelines was written at a time when the data was yeah, used from previous publications uh, some uh, at least a decade ago. But this is 2017. This is a single center experience from France. If one of the predictors of outcomes was simply a peak velocity of five meters about second or greater. So the, the cutoff here, if you divide the overall aortic stenosis population uh, using the peak velocity of five, you can see greater than five meters per second has worse, significantly worse survival during a follow-up period than those with less than five meters per second. Severe aortic stenosis, very severe aortic stenosis. There is such a category called very severe aortic stenosis, and the cutoff is five. And if you look at asymptomatic patients only, not all comers, this is about 600, 550 patients, you can see the same data here. The separation based on five meters per second still is valid in patients who are asymptomatic. In other words, those with five meters per second or greater who are asymptomatic constitute a high-risk substrate in, pa uh, in patients with aortic stenosis. So even in this classic variety, we are beginning to identify that not all of these fit in those four meters per second, 40 millimeter mean gradient aortic valve area of less than one or an indexed valve area of 0.6. Among this, there is this high-risk category. At least now, there is gathering evidence of five meters per second. And in fact, in the guidelines, they've already recognized this, at least in the ACCHA guidelines, in the European guidelines, they use 5.5 meters per second, and there is now a move to change that down to five meters per second. This is even more recent. This is in press. In fact, I just got the PDF of this publication. This is a, from a large database from this heart valve clinic group. Um, this is a unique data because it comes from about 10 centers around the world. These are patients followed up in a heart valve clinic, um, and these are patients with mild, moderate, and severe aortic stenosis. If you look at the follow-up of these patients, this is a contemporary natural history of aortic stenosis. The best predictor of worst outcomes in a group of patients with um, greater than mild aortic stenosis is five meters per second. Anything over five meters per second differentiates those patients who have a very high mortality, um, even if they're asymptomatic. And then you have the patients with the classic variety of uh, severe aortic stenosis who also have increased mortality compared to moderate aortic stenosis, no question. But you can see within that severe aortic stenosis a differentiation based on uh, five meters per second. There are ways of predicting patients who are going to be worse, there is the, who are called fast progressors. And those are those who uh, the mean gradient goes up by about seven or eight per year, or the valve area decreases by about 0.2 centimeters per second, or 0.1 centimeter per second per year, um, or a peak velocity goes up by 0.2 meters per second per year. So if you choose to follow up a patient at 4.9 or 4.7, these are indications of patients who may get up to five meters per second fairly quickly. And it's very important to realize because the mortality in this group is very high, it's 2% per month. This is a 69-year-old calcified restricted aortic valve, normal ejection fraction will follow the same schema, 
abnormal valve, normal ejection fraction. And now we are looking at the stroke volume index. It is 43, which is normal, greater than 35. Peak velocity of 3.3, mean gradient of only 26, and a, but a calculated aortic valve area of 0.7, severe aortic stenosis. So there is a discrepancy here. Normal flow, abnormal valve, and yet the mean gradient is not consistent with that flow. Can that happen? It sure can happen. And these are patients you will often sometimes see who have normal flow, normal ejection fraction, but have a low gradient. And there are these group of patients with normal EF, normal flow, but low gradient severe aortic stenosis based on aortic valve area. If you see these patients, then the first thing from an echocardiography point of view is to recheck that your measurements are all right. If your measurements are all done correctly, this may be truly moderate AS and may not be severe AS at 0.7. Uh, it may not be because the mean gradient of 40 usually occurs when the aortic valve area is about 0.75, although currently in all guidelines, we use a cutoff of one centimeter per second. There is evidence that with this one centimeter per second, it does not necessarily generate a 40 millimeter gradient. And the 40 millimeter gradient usually comes at 0.75. So this discrepancy may be explained this way. Normally, the flow across the aortic valve is about 250 mils per minute. So if you look at two, this is normal flow. And if you look at a 40 millimeter gradient, the intersection of these two occurs at an aortic valve area of about 0.75. At an aortic valve area of 0.1 uh, or 1, which is a current cutoff, you can see that that is still not at point. It doesn't intersect it until we get up here to normal flow. So if you have normal flow, to get to a mean gradient of 40, your aortic valve area, the flow has to increase. Unless it's get up to 275, you really it does not touch the aortic valve area of 1. In other words, sometimes when you see normal ejection fraction, a normal flow and a low gradient and an aortic valve area of let's say 0.8, that may be explained by the fact that you will not get a mean gradient of 40 until the valve area becomes less than 0.7 or 0.75. So that would be the true cutoff for uh, severe aortic stenosis. There is, this is some old data, this is not new. It happens in real life. This is some very nice data from a large population, all comers in a routine clinical practice if you look at these patients, 3,500, uh, nearly 3,500 patients, if you look at mean pressure gradient greater than 40, many of these patients have an aortic valve area less than one, consistent, land of milk and honey, no problem. But, and also here is aortic valve area greater than one, and many of these patients have a mean gradient less than 40, no problem. These are numbers that make sense. But about in a third of patients, 30% of the patients, they have a mean gradient of less than 40 and at an aortic valve area of less than one. Severe aortic stenosis based on this, but not severe aortic stenosis based on mean gradient. Their discrepancy is real. And the way to explain this is that the real cutoff should be about 0.75 and not one, which is physiologically correct. So this remains a challenge in clinical setting, but we have to carefully look for it. If you use peak velocity, it's the same thing four meters per second or greater, um, you get a mean gradient or a peak velocity of four meters per gradient. You can see the valve area is less than one. So severe aortic stenosis. A, mean a peak velocity of less than four, the valve area is usually greater than one. So it makes sense. But then there are these group of patients, about a quarter of these patients, that have a, a peak velocity of less than four and yet have severe aortic stenosis based on valve area. So those are all these group of patients. So there is enough in the literature for us here. So these may be truly moderate AS. The problem with this is that it may not be moderate AS because we just said that it is, um, if they're truly moderate, then the two-year survival is very good. But about 50% of these patients have true severe aortic stenosis, and it's hard to tell the difference based on hemodynamics or echocardiography. And these are patients that benefit from calcium score of the aortic valve. We know a calcium score of the aortic valve of greater than 2,000 in men, and 1,200 in women is very suggestive of severe aortic stenosis, and they don't do very well. So this is an important category to 
not only understand but also to differentiate from true moderate AS from, uh, from the 50% of the patients who may have severe AS. And the one way to do it is to consider doing CT calcium score and not stop with echocardiography. In fact, one of the things we wrote about from the Havoc group uh, about this group of patients is if they are asymptomatic, uh, CT should become a class one indication, which is not in the guidelines right now. And if they are, uh, if they are symptomatic, if they're asymptomatic, we suggest that CT should be a class two A indication for prognostic value to differentiate moderate AS from severe AS in these group of patients. Then there are these group of patients, normal EF, low flow, so they have a stroke volume index of less than 35, but yet manifest high gradient. These two should go hand in hand. If you have high normal flow, you should get high gradient. If you have low flow, you're supposed to get low gradient. And this discrepancy is not uncommon. It's typically seen in patients who are very big, BSA of greater than 2.1, and their BMI is usually more than 30. And that is because when you take the absolute stroke volume and index it by this number right here, you artificially lower the flow in these patients. And so it's best not to index stroke volume in BMI, BSA is greater than 2.1 or a BMI greater than 30, but to take the absolute stroke volume. The absolute stroke volume in these patients are usually normal, and therefore this high gradient will make sense. And these now belong to this category, normal EF, low flow, high gradient, severe aortic stenosis. They are not going to do well. These patients, two-year survival is about 30% and absolutely benefit from AVR. So recognize this pattern of hemodynamics for those of you who either look at the reports or even deal with these patients. Another way to differentiate these patients is to do calcium score of the aortic valve. Again, the same parameters apply, and there are some emerging um, data from global longitudinal strain. I won't get into that today. And there is a way to calculate the so-called aortic impedance or the ZVA number, which is easily done uh, as a sum of the mean gradient plus the systolic blood pressure divided by the stroke volume index. And if that is greater than 4.5, it is very suggestive of severe aortic stenosis. So there are ways of teasing out these patients, but recognizing them is the first step. Next, we have a 70-year-old um, with a normal ejection fraction, abnormal valve, heavily cal calcified, significantly restricted. Now when we look at the stroke volume index here, normal EF, stroke volume index is low, very low, less than 35. And if you look at the peak velocity, 3.6, mean gradient of 32, and yet the calculated aortic valve area is 0.73. Severe aortic stenosis, but these numbers are not commensurate with severe aortic stenosis possibly explained by this low stroke volume right here. So it kind of makes sense here because low stroke volume and these numbers perhaps go hand in hand. This is a very important group of patients to recognize. Not uncommon at all. In some practices, this is up to 25% of the patients we see more commonly in the range of 15% of the patients with severe aortic stenosis. Low flow, normal EF. Low flow, low gradient. Makes sense, makes sense. All of this will make sense, it's consistent, um, and they are classified as normal EF, low flow, low gradient, severe AS. This is the so-called paradoxical low gradient, severe AS. These patients have severe aortic stenosis. The one way to tease them out, if you're not sure about aortic stenosis here because of the low flow and the low gradient, is to calculate the ZVA score. And for this, the systolic blood pressure must be less than 140. You cannot do this when the patients are hypertensive. In this particular patient, it is 5.3. Anything over 4.5 is highly suggestive of severe obstruction to the aortic valve. And you can do a calcium score of the um, aortic valve. Who are these patients? Typically, these are women. Uh, they tend to predominate in this category right here. They have severe left ventricular hypertrophy. Their end diastolic dimension and end diastolic volume index is very small. So think about a very small, thick-walled heart, which does not have a much of a blood 
to pump really, so low flow. That is how the stroke volume is low in these patients. They are also patients with other valve disease. Significant regurgitant disease will uh, obviously reduce cardiac output and stroke volume to the aortic valve, and these patients are also sometimes seen in this category. It's important to recognize because the two-year survival is very low in these patients, and they, and they definitely benefit from aortic valve replacement. So if you look at these normal EF, classic definition of aortic stenosis. You have these classic patients, and then you have the three other varieties of patients that may come fully explained even though there are discrepant hemodynamic findings. So here is the way you can use the other parameters in this group of patients, calcium score, longitudinal strain, and ZVA. These are three additional things that we have learned over a period of time that helps us to differentiate these complex patients. Based on this, if these patients are symptomatic, we say CT scan is very helpful in this low gradient aortic stenosis because a CT calcium score is differentiate, uh, differentiates these patients from severe from moderate AS. And then if they are asymptomatic, then CT is a 2A for differentiating moderate from severe aortic stenosis. So if they're symptomatic, you must, uh, we recommend that CT is essential. If they're asymptomatic, you should consider CT. It's important to recognize and differentiate moderate AS from this low gradient severe aortic stenosis. Because when you follow this low gradient severe aortic stenosis, they hit this 0.75 area at least a year to year and a half earlier than a truly moderate AS who may go on for another two years before they hit this severe aortic stenosis. So it's very important to differentiate, not assume that this is moderate AS, but to differentiate and establish a proper diagnosis. And it can be done. A word about ejection fraction and aortic stenosis. In the guidelines at the present time, the, defi the definition of normal ejection fraction is greater than 50%. I'm not sure this is the right thing. In fact, there is now evidence, and this is the paper that's coming out, that ejection fraction of less than 60% may in fact be abnormal in aortic stenosis. So the measurement of ejection fraction in AS becomes critical, and it becomes important because we cannot assume an EF of, we don't wait until the EF gets up to 50, 55%. In fact, now there is data that suggests that LVEF less than 60% may be a trigger. There is now a active discussion going on in the valve circles to make this a class one indication for aortic valve replacement. Because an LVEF of less than 60% with an afterload mismatch in aortic stenosis cannot be normal. We should not be waiting for an EF of 50%. Here's a, a lady who obviously has LV dysfunction, severe calcified aortic valve, restricted valve. The question here usually is, is it because of low stroke volume, because of reduced ejection fraction, or is it truly restricted valve? And the way to solve it is to look at the stroke volume index. It is low, it is less than 35, but look at her gradients, even with the low flow, this lady is able to generate, or this valve generates, a peak velocity of four, a mean gradient of 40. So when you have this, this becomes moot. In low flow, if you're generating this gradients, then in a normal flow, these gradients are going to be very high. So the way to deal with low flow abnormal ejection fraction is to look at your velocity and gradients. If they're high and they're consistent with severe aortic stenosis, no further testing is necessary. This in itself, an EF of 40% by itself, is an indication for AVR. Another way to confirm this is to take the ratio of this velocity to this velocity. It's called the dimensionless index. If that is less than 0.25, then it is severe aortic stenosis. So we can see it is 0.16. So clearly, this is severe aortic stenosis, despite the fact that there is low flow. So the, the other group of patients, so in high gradient, in low EF, is not a problem. The EF is a trigger in itself for an AVR, and the high gradient confirms a diagnosis, irrespective of the flow situation in these patients. Where, if you have normal flow in the setting of abnormal EF, you will have a low gradient sometimes, and low EF, so these patients belong to low EF, normal flow, low gradient, just like these patients. When you have normal flow, you should have 
abnormal, uh, you should have a high gradient, but these patients are like these patients over here. They tend to be larger, their body surface area is very big, so they may manifest low gradient. Again, don't, um, don't index the stroke volume here, and these gradients may actually turn to be sensible compared to this stroke volume right here. You can do dobutamine stress echo, which is recommended in these patients when you have low flow, low gradient, like this group of patients with normal EF. You can do low flow, low gradient, low EF. So these are other category of patients. Here, dobutamine stress is very helpful. Even before doing dobutamine stress in a pure resting echo, always look at the acceleration time. The acceleration time is ignored in aortic stenosis. It's a simple Doppler index. When they trace the Doppler, so CW Doppler, if your, aortic, uh, if your acceleration time is greater than 120 milliseconds and you've done it right, it doesn't matter what the peak velocity is, what the gradient is, that is telling you that that valve is not normal. That is very specific for severe aortic stenosis. If it is greater than 100 milliseconds, it's very indicative of severe aortic stenosis. The limitation here is the heart rate. If the heart rate is over 100 beats per minute, these numbers don't work. But you should not be assessing aortic stenosis in tachycardia anyway. The best way to look at those tachycardic patients is slow the heart rate down and then remeasure everything. So don't ignore acceleration time number in the Doppler index. And then of course the dimensionless index typically is less than 0.25 even before you embark on dobutamine stress echo. So dobutamine stress echo is in the guidelines. It's a class 2A indication when you have low EF, low flow in patients with aortic stenosis. Two or three important practical issues. Uh, this question always comes up. What should we be looking at? Absolute numbers of aortic valve area or the index number? Here is some instructive data from one of the largest studies ever done to answer. It is one of them, this is retrospective, this is prospective data. And if you look at uh, prevalence of severe aortic stenosis, right, um, you can see aortic valve area of less than one centimeter square measured in the conventional fashion. Those are these middle bars right here, right? And these are different body surface areas. If you look at what happens when you index, which is this last tall bars over here in each of these columns, you see what happens when you have a large person. If you take a person who's got a body surface area of greater than two, and you index the aortic valve area, you dramatically increase the incidence or the prevalence of severe aortic stenosis. It is controversial whether or not to index aortic valve area in the normal population. The only population where the aortic valve area measured conventionally and the indexed aortic valve area uh, cutoff match for severe aortic stenosis or in those patients who are small, which are body surface area of less than 1.7. So the message here is at least based on this large data, the recommendation is you don't index patients' uh, aortic valve area routinely. You should not do that. Because the current relationship between aortic valve area and aortic valve index is based on a body surface area of 1.67. So if you take the cutoff of one divided by 1.67, it gives you the current cutoff for aortic valve index definition of severe aortic stenosis 0.6. The problem is, if you look at the run of the milk Caucasian population in North America and Europe, the body surface area is usually 1.89 to 1.91. So these cutoffs don't make sense to use in this population. The one population where it may be beneficial are those whose body surface area is less than 1.7. In those areas, indexing becomes right. So which is right, indexing or not indexing? In the same data, there is some now instructive information. These are patients classified as severe aortic stenosis using aortic valve area done in the conventional way, not indexed. You can see that they have more events over a long-term follow-up. These are patients classified as having severe aortic stenosis based on indexing aortic valve area, 0.6. They have less in events than these patients over here. What is happening here is this is misclassifying some mild and moderate aortic stenosis as severe aortic stenosis, and that's why they are having less events. So indexing aortic valve area as a rule of thumb, we don't do it in our lab unless the body surface area is less than 
We don't do it in other populations at all. And it looks like that is the good practice to do because it often um, increases the um, level of uh, or the prevalence of aortic severus artificially. So the other way to look at it is modify the cutoff for aortic valve area index for severe aortic stenosis. At the present time, it's 0.6. It's perhaps too high. We should probably be using 0.5, at least in North America and the European population, because the, in the body surface area is typically between 1.8 and 1.9 in this population. If you go to the Japanese population, for example, there is a nice study out that shows that using this cutoff is the best cutoff, not 0.5, because they typically have a body surface area, something in the range of 1.5 to 1.7, small body surface area. So their indexing becomes important, but not routinely in everybody. Last word about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is not uncommon, especially in these elderly patients with aortic stenosis. Very challenging to do aortic stenosis in atrial fibrillation. There is a simple way to do this. This is a, a, a classic example. Normal, uh, relatively normal LV function, right? An elderly lady, um, and she has abnormal valves right here, classified, restricted valve in short axis and in the long axis. Don't ever look at gradients in, a, in, in, um, in atrial fibrillation. Even if they're controlled atrial fibrillation, don't look at gradients because they typically have very low stroke volume. Here is a stroke volume index, 16, even in controlled atrial fibrillation uh, because this is, um, they're, they're, the stroke volume is dependent on flow and that flow is usually abnormal in atrial fibrillation. But you can look at the CW of the aortic valve, the continuous wave Doppler of the aortic valve. The trick here is don't do it in rapid atrial fibrillation. If it's 100 beats or more, control the AFib before you make any conclusions about aortic stenosis. Once you control, you find three beats which have relatively constant RR intervals, and you'll usually find them. Uh, you'll usually find. So this is the, you find three beats like this. So these are two cycles in which the RR interval is within 15% of each other. If you find this relatively constant RR interval, that is like sinus rhythm, if you will, you measure the third beat and take all the numbers from here for the calculation of, um, of um, aortic valve area. The conventional thing that people do is to average five beats. Nobody knows where that came out of. There is absolutely no data to support that. There is absolutely, in fact, there is data now to support the contrary. That is, if you manifest four meters per second at a controlled AFib about 70 or 80 beats per minute, and if even if you have a one spectral Doppler envelope of four meters per second, that probably reflects severe aortic stenosis. You don't even have average five beats. But if you don't like that, you can also use this method, which is to use what is called matched RR intervals. You'll find three beats like this, and the third beat is indicative of the hemodynamics in these two beats or constant flow situation, and this reflects a constant flow. So this is one method of different. Not to be ignored because AFib is very common in these patients, and AFib by per se is a marker of high risk in patients with aortic stenosis, and you get an aortic valve area of 0.48. So the milieu of severe aortic stenosis is no more this particular flow, which used to be all we used to think about severe aortic stenosis. We have all of this hemodynamic um, morphology now, if you will, of aortic stenosis. If we follow a schema based on ejection fraction, flow, gradient, we can classify this aortic stenosis. Think about CT scan of the aortic valve and the calcium score. Think about using strain data, which is evolving, not there yet, and the ZVA calculation. Put all of this together, you should be able to tease out severe AS in most situations. Thank you for your attention. What a fabulous talk. Thank you, Manny. It was, it was outstanding. Uh, so now we have Dr. Annapurna Kinney. Uh, she's the director of our cath lab and uh, also the director of interventional program for uh, uh, Mount Sinai Health System. And uh, uh, the person who, the uh, uh, woman who does the maximum number of uh, interventions in the country are probably in the world. 
and uh, an outstanding uh, this thing. So I always tell them that if I ever developed uh, a STEMI, I basically either want Samin there or Annapurna Kini there. So uh, Dr. Kini, transcatheter valvular interventions, when is surgical intervention appropriate? Surgical. <laughs> Aren't you surprised at this uh, topic? When is the surgical intervention appropriate? OK, thank you, Dr. Narula. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I would like to thank Dr. Sharma for giving me this uh, title. When is surgical intervention appropriate? Or maybe I'll be talking when most of the time we are doing a percutaneous uh, intervention. Uh, essentially going to discuss uh, what is out there, percutaneous uh, uh, valve therapy uh, for uh, all kinds of valves, and as in, I have no disclosure. So this is uh, where we are with regards to the aortic valve, uh, which is a percutaneous valve here, mitral valve. If you have mitral regurgitation, we have the clip. Um, this is, would be for uh, valve in valve um, or valve in ring. For tricuspid uh, regurgitation, same thing is the clip or there is a valve. And then for the pulmonic, we have the melody valve that is available. So aortic stenosis, we all know that normal about three to four centimeters squared and severe less than one centimeter squared, or this is where we are uh, critical. Etiology, most of it is acquired. Congenital and other things are very rare. And this is what is important for us, that this is where we see 5% at the age of uh, 70 years, 10% at 80 years, and you see that almost 20% at 90 years. And this is uh, the brown wall, what you are taught way back, that if you develop symptoms with aortic stenosis, that is when you know your survival is uh, poor, whatever the symptoms are, whether it's angina, syncope, or heart failure. The treatment of choice, until uh, the last seven, eight years always was a surgical treatment, and uh, subsequently the percutaneous therapy, which is the two FDA-approved valves, which are right here, and for uh, other patients, there is what's called as uh, the balloon valve plastic. So aortic stenosis, uh, this is ants, uh, you know, sour. This is based on the circulation and the guidelines. If you see here the definitions, which I just made with that four meter per squared, um, valve area of one centimeter squared or a mean gradient of more than 40 centimeters squared. And this is where I think they have defined that this is severe aortic stenosis. Then you decide whether the patient has symptoms or no. If you have symptoms, you see what your ejection fraction is, normal, do nothing, just monitor them. L uh, low ejection fraction, uh, that is where you go, that you, the indication for uh, replacement. And if this is what, if, if equivocal symptoms, that's a time you do a stress test, and this is a key, I think, for general cardiologists. What do you look for? Somebody with aortic stenosis, and you need to know, should I do something or no, is um, lack in augmentation of the blood pressure. Uh, if there are symptoms, definitely they should get uh, treatment. And other thing that we know that if they are, have CAD and they have moderate aortic stenosis, at the same time they can have replacement. And they, why do we need surgery? Because it has shown patients live longer, better life, and more important is LV function if they do have LV dysfunction. So what do we go on? Uh, percutaneous therapy currently is based on what is called as a surgical risk, what is called as STS risk calculator. It is online available and everything you call, all the patient data, you will put it online and then you will get a number. And this number is critical for us to decide what is the treatment that we are going to uh, do per, for patients and very important for the heart team uh, discussion. And I'm talking about heart team means every percutaneous valve therapy is based on the interventional cardiologist, the cardiologist, and a surgeon have to see the patient and have all the data in front of them before they can make a decision what is the appropriate treatment for the patient. So based on the number we have given, if the number is less than three, we call them low risk. Three to eight is intermediate risk. And this is approximately the patients that uh, belong there. And anything above eight is high risk. And this is extreme risk patients. And if you see here, there are what we call as more than 50, where we call it uh, probably a futile. So these are the two FDA approved devices, which I already spoke uh, about. Edward Sapien valve, way uh, earlier in the market, then came the core valve. Just to show you the case, um, the, this is the kind of patients that we used to do once upon a time. 94-year-old lady was a, a fairly 
normal person, if you see her on no medication, barely saw a doctor, had GI bleed, uh, bleed on aspirin, but more important, presented with heart failure symptoms um, as well as angina. So echocardiogram did show that she, she had severe aortic stenosis with normal EF, EKG was normal. So cath did show that uh, she had, I'll show you the cath in a minute, this was uh, the echo with EF normal and your mean gradient of 48. So if you see here, significant left main disease, calcific LAD, circumflex disease. This is the cranial view, lot of calcium, diagonal disease also. And this is the right coronary artery again, mid to distal significant disease. So what would you do in this kind of a patient, 94 year old, but although 94, normal patient. So the CT angiogram showed that she had a reasonable uh, femoral uh, access and her STS mortality was 8.1, which puts her into high risk at th that time. And the patient at that time, as we know, was determined high risk for AVR cabbage. And this is the kind of patient where you know there's complex coronary artery disease along with the valvular heart disease, the treatment of choice would be to have surgery. So decision was made to go through a percutaneous route and this is a route also very important that the family has been involved and that they know there is risk involved even in this percutaneous treatment. She was done as a live relay ACC March uh, 2014. So when you have severe aortic stenosis and we know we are going to handle complex coronary artery disease, you need uh, the valve that is functioning. So that's why she had a BAV and you know, um, orbital atherectomy followed by the stenting of her uh, LAD. This is what you would do. Do the most significant disease and the least minimum possible. So she had the BAV and uh, left main LAD PCI, went home with a plan that she came back and had a right coronary artery intervened, had a stent to the right coronary artery, which was successful and subsequently came back. So you give four to five weeks gap between each procedure and she came back and came, uh, had her core valve, which is, uh, you see the core valve deployment here. This is positioning. This is the, the key. Before you release the valve, you have to make sure that the lower part of the valve is anchored on both sinuses, which looks good. And this is the time we will pace and release. At that time, if there is paravalvular leak, we can go back and post dilate the valve. This is the final result. So here we have this lady. Um, so we, if, uh, with regards to follow up, four months later, she did require have a hospitalization requiring blood transfusion. We knew that she could not tolerate aspirin. So at that time, stopped the aspirin, only continued on Plavix. Recently seen in the clinic, and this is what happens. Every patient is seen at 30 days for an echo and subsequently every year. So uh, four years post hour doing well and on no medications right now. So how did we reach uh, to this conclusion of uh, elderly patients getting a, a percutaneous therapy? The initial trial was a partner uh, trial cohort B, which was extreme risk where standard of therapy where nothing was done, medical therapy or uh, BAV on this patient and who got tower. If you see her at one year, 20% reduction compared to standard of care. And at that time it was decided patients with extreme risk or high risk should only get tower. So when the core valve came into market, all they did was only tower, they, they, there was no standard of therapy. And you see here at one year, uh, patients who got tower had better survival. Then going to the high risk patient, which was a partner trial cohort A, again, that uh, surgery as well as uh, tower were comparable. One thing, and this is the only trial which had shown that uh, tower had increased CVA compared to SAVR, but subsequently no other trials had shown that. And the core war trial, which is a primary endpoint at three years, if you take all cause death, again, if you see a tower actually did better compared to surgery in this um, high risk patient. Then going to intermediate risk patient, we are talking about uh, three to eight uh, tower versus SAVR, partner 2A trial and SIRTAVI trial, where SIRTAVI trial compared surgery versus uh, uh, tower. Here was same surgery versus uh, the sapien valve. Again, they were comparable, no difference between the two. 
Now, very important, and everybody has to know how the, the percutaneous valve behave compared to the surgical valve. So this is what it is, two years gradient, aortic valve area 2.2, that is the tower compared to surgical valve of 1.7, and look at the gradient, just less than 10, and here we are about 12, so very comparable to that. So this is where we are. So bleed based on all this trial, we know that extreme risk, high risk, intermediate risk tower was approved uh, in this patient after having had a heart team discussion. Where are we with the low risk patients where, you know, younger patients with you have STS risk care of uh, less than three. One trial has been done, which was outside the United States, which we will show you the result. Two other trials have been uh, done in the U.S completed and the results will be presented in uh, ACC 2019. So the notion trial, essentially same thing, low risk patient, 280 patient randomized to SAVR versus uh, TAVR. And this is what it is at one year. This, this is the mean SCS score, 2.9 to 3.1. If you compare, no difference. And in SAVR, uh, you know, increased uh, bleeding. And we all know that Tower means you have an increased risk of a pacemaker, and the same thing even at four to five years, uh, both group did well. Partner three, this is the study design. So what, what we have reached in partner three is symptomatic severe calcific aortic stenosis started with the age of less than 65. Right now they have taken the age cutoff, but very important is transfemoral approach. That if you are doing tower right now you got to consider doing only transfemoral approach. Non-transfemoral, non-other uh, access site, they only maintain them as registry, comparing a uh, sapien valve uh, against surgery, and this is a metronic core valve, is the same thing. Uh, they have a sub-study of a CT scan looking for, uh, you know, leaflet uh, of issues. Now, this is the current indication. Again, we are talking about symptomatic aortic stenosis would be that if you are intermediate risk, would be tower, and this is where we are with high risk and extreme risk. Low risk, trials are ongoing, and we will have the results uh, soon. Now there is a subgroup of patient where we call that they may have um, low risk on STS, but what can happen is they have other factors which are not included in your risk score, which is hostile mediastinum, eggshell iota, prior cabbage with your lima that is stuck to the mediastinum or it crosses across and extreme frailty. So this is when the surgeons, though the patient has low risk, surgeons will uh, then tell us probably this is a patient uh, should go for uh, um, tower rather than SAVR. And this is uh, what it is, the guidelines essentially telling us high risk, prohibitive risk, they are all uh, tower, intermediate risk initially used to be surgical AVR and right now tower is a class 2A indication, class 1 uh, as of uh, the recent trial. Then what is the evolution for 2018 and future? This is valve in valve, trials are ongoing, predominantly aortic regurgitation. If you have aortic stenosis, we know we have calcific valve, we need the calcium for the valve to remain there so it will get anchored. So in aortic regurgitation, predominant aortic regurgitation, these valves um, fail, they usually embolize. Bicuspid aortic stenosis, trial is ongoing, Low flow, low gradient AS, trial is ongoing. This is asymptomatic severe AS. The where we are talking, if you see the initial chart I told you, medical therapy, what is called as early tower, and moderate AS with severe heart failure, it's called as unload tower. All these trials are ongoing, and we will have the results in the next couple of years. This is just showing valve in valve. You can do a bioprosthetic uh, um, tower. This is the sapien valve in position. This is how it looks after the procedure. So potential complications is most important that everybody is worried, even though they are 80, 90 years, they would not want to have a stroke and uh, remain in a nursing home. So this is what they're worried about and pacemaker, of course, I've just mentioned. So the embolic protection device that we have for tower right now we can protect it. These are the tower devices that are out there um, for the aortic stenosis. These are the tower aortic valve for pure AI, which are under uh, all under investigation. This is the tower growth here at Mount Sinai. Last year, we did about uh, 306 pro procedures um, with our length of stay about uh, uh, 
uh, four days, but this is what is the tower US volume, which was just recently published. If you see here, the total number of hospitals, probably about 600, 584, maybe about close to 600 hospitals doing it. By the end of this year, we may even reach 50,000 uh, tower procedures, but more importantly, the ninth decline that you see the, in, in hospital mortality going down to about 1.5%. This is our volume and outcomes compared to TBT registry. Every data, the, every case that we do is entered in the registry, which is maintained by the TBT. And if compared to that, we are doing extremely well, except for uh, some increase in pacemaker rate and uh, our mortality, very good. Moving on to mitral valve therapy. So if you see mitral regurgitation, total MR patient about 4.1 million. And this is mitral regurgitation greater than three plus on uh, uh, echo about 1.7 million out there. But if you see uh, and, uh, annual incidence about 14% newly diagnosed, MV surgery about only 30,000. So you see that only 2% of uh, 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 patients are treated. There's a large growing and clinical unmet need there. And we all know based on the degree of MR, uh, based on the EF of the patient, as well as the symptoms, the outcome is poor. Essentially that these patients need something done. And classification of MR, two types, primary where you have pathology of the valve itself, and secondary where you have LV dilation due to heart failure or primary myocardial pathology, and that re uh, resulting in mitral regurgitation. Current therapy, we all know medical therapy is a must for all these patients. Highly invasive is surgery, and what we have in between percutaneous therapy is called as mitra clip. And this is what the mitral clip therapy, if you see here, it's a percutaneous therapy that we go from the vein, close to 10, uh, 21 French sheath, cross the transeptal, this is where we place the sheath. You remove the gum, and I will just show you how the clip will be inserted. And the most important thing about this, you see that the clip comes here, we are able to navigate it uh, at lateral, medial, posterior, anterior, but this procedure essentially is not fluoroscopy guided, it's echo guided. We need a echo person in the room who is doing a TE and telling us every step of the procedure. And other important thing here is the transeptal is a key. And this is a very important step that you got to get the transeptal at the right position. So that is where also the echocardiography is very important to tell us so that we are able to approach the valve at, from the right height and the angle has to be correct. So the transeptal is very important here. And this is how you can see, you can uh, place the uh, clip, you're not happy, you can detach and read, um, uh, you know, place the clip again. Now, how Everest 2 randomized trial was a study design, you see here 279 patients, randomized two to one, this is the control versus the device group. Patients were followed for 30 days, up to five years, six months, one year, five years, having had echo, and primary endpoints per protocol was, was the device safe? Yeah, of course, it was, it was shown that it was safe com, com, uh, compared to the control, which was surgery, and effectiveness, not as effective as surgery, but definitely there was, uh, was effective. Based on the trial, the uh, publication was, uh, came out in New England Journal and led to the FDA approval of this device, saying that although the repair is less effective in reducing mitral regurgitation than conventional surgery, it was associated with safety and clinical outcome improvement. And if you see here when I meant uh, outcome improvement, at 12 months, if you go to the device, 18% of the patient, three plus to four plus MR compared to surgery, uh, so um, compared to surgery, you're only about 0%, right? Of a three to four plus. But if you take their symptoms, because they go home on medical therapy, symptomatology wise, they are, they are only seven and eight percent. Essentially saying, even though you left some uh, MR, it's not as effective, you can continue them on medical therapy and they can have that. This is a case of a clip, the same 79 year old female, cardiomyopathy, 25% EF, uh, uh, EF with ICD, and good medical therapy, heart team evaluation because of the comorbidity and frailty was considered for mitral valve, uh, uh, not for mitral valve surgery, she had the clip. So you can see a 2D echo showing severe mitral regurgitation, 3D echo showing the prolapse of the anterior posterior leaflet and what we do, simultaneous measurement of the left um, 
atrial pressure which is about 80 millimeters uh, mercury here which is very high which is essentially saying it's severe MR. So if you can see here you can a clip has been placed uh, 3D echo the clip is placed and you see from 80 we went down to 50. Check the gradient that you are not causing mitral stenosis the gradient is okay that means you're less than uh, seven we proceed with the second clip so we can uh, second clip was placed went down to close to 40 and we know there's still residual MR and the three clips were placed. And if you see, three clips here uh, went down to close to between uh, 20 to 25. So this is what happens. You always check your uh, gradient about three and that's when you know you are okay that you could really see on your third clip. This trial was recently presented a uh, TCT, um, which is a trial where they use clip for patients with heart failure and secondary mitral regurgitation. So Everest trial, after the Everest trial, the um, clip was um, approved for patients with uh, primary pathology. So what do we see? Patients with advanced heart failure, about 40% of them have concomitant uh, mitral regurgitation, approximately about 5 million people with heart failure in the United States. So co-op trial randomized mitral uh, patients with uh, um, guided medical therapy, which is uh, plus mitral uh, clip for just medical therapy alone. So inclusion criteria was very strict. We were part of the trial that patients had to have low EF, moderate to severe MR, and heart failure symptoms on medical therapy with BNP of greater than 300. So very strict follow-up here. And this is what happened with the randomization, 302 patients in each arm. And if you see here, very sick population. If you say, uh, take their uh, uh, baseline criteria, your uh, STS score of 7.8 and 8.5, look at their BNP on therapy over a thousand or so. Uh, this is the essentially saying that patients had three plus to four plus MR on therapy. This is the medical uh, uh, medications where patients were used on, 90% of them, or uh, they were on most of them beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, uh, um, corticosteroid, mineral uh, nitrates, hydralazine, and diuretic, most of them nine. Then very important for us, did they continue therapy, change therapy, any one of them, maybe between uh, five to uh, seven percent of them had to decrease the dose, change the medication, but essentially everybody was on good medical therapy. So the procedure, which is very important to notice, is that majority of them got one to two clip which, why is important? Because your residual MR, if you take collective residual MR, which is less than two plus 90, more than 95% of the patients were less, uh, uh, got, wow, less than 2% mitral regurgitation and 82% of the patient had less than 1%, uh, sorry, one plus MR. So very important that you have to do a good job when you're taking care of these patients. So the primary endpoint at 24 months was mitral clip with medical therapy versus medical therapy, all hospitalization for heart failure significantly reduced compared to medical therapy, and more important was all-cause mortality, 20% reduction in patients uh, who got clip compared to just medical therapy. Um, now moving on to the early clinical experience for, this was a clip for MR, that are there valves for uh, mitral valve disease, yes, a lot of them in the trial were the first in human versus uh, the trials out there, which is uh, what we see here, Abbott Tendine, we are a part of that as well as uh, Medtronic uh, 12 valve, which is being done here. And then uh, this is the MITRA trial, which uh, was published last year. Essentially, what they did was they took the sapien valve and placed as valve in patients who had prior prosthetic valve or valve in ring or native uh, severe calcific uh, mitral annular calcification. What they showed was valve in ring, 100% transeptal access. That is why knowing how to do transeptal is key uh, for everybody who is getting into structural heart disease now. So that is possible with all cause mortality, about 6.6%, uh, essentially very sick patient. And this is another thing that we need to know was that patients who have native MAC Procedural outcome was uh, very poor. Look at the in-hospital mortality, 16.7% and lot of apical and transatrial approaches were uh, used in this trial. 
Since then, it has become class three indication that if you have native uh, uh, mitral annular calcification, uh, it is not an indication to do well uh, in the native. So this is a case that we did here, 81 year old female who has a shortness of breath NYJ class three and bioprosthetic uh, MVR, so STS score of 9.4, bioprosthetic valve, which is both, uh, you'll see it, uh, mitral regurgitation as well as stenosis. Again, transeptal, get your sapien valve across into the mitral, uh, you know, previous mitral uh, 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 bioprocesses and you inflate. Absence of mitral regurgitation, but more important, if you see the echocardiogram, the valve, the new valve, no stenosis or mitral regurgitation. So just to show that uh, what we have done as a part of a teaching, we just released what is called as an app, transeptated app, which is free. Anybody wants to learn how to do this transeptal procedures, it's free to download from the App Store and Google Play right now. May be able to do the mitral clip sitting at home. <laughs> so this is what the app includes which is showing you the video, how to do it, with fluoroscopy side by side, exactly where you are to place all this device and techniques. And uh, where do we do the puncture, which is correct puncture, which is wrong puncture, don't go near the iota. And the, this on the top is a tracker, which tells you where, which part of the app you are. Just moving on to the therapy of tricuspid valve. If you see here, very complex valve, tricuspid, which is aortic, septal, and uh, posterior leaflet, and primary as well as functional uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Well, patients treated, if you see here, is very few. Majority of them are uh, functional, and if you see a surgical procedure, only 0.4% of the TR patients are being treated currently out there, and we know what is a survival, moderate to severe uh, TR, had very poor survival at follow-up, and this is the landscape. When you see so many things out there, means nothing works. So you have annuloplasty and direct annual ring with the millipede uh, and the cardio band. And again, the clip that I spoke to, the mitral clip is being also uh, being tried on the tricuspid. This is how the tricuspid cl clipping strategy, very complex, but still is doable. And we are part of the Abbott Triluminate uh, study uh, right here in Mount Sinai. Uh, for patients who have severe tricuspid regurgitation. So just to conclude, TOWER approved for intermediate and high-risk patients and TOWER for low-risk is under trial, which will be presented during ACC 2019. So mitral clip therapy is now FDA approved for symptomatic patients with severe MR of degenerative etiology who are poor surgical candidates. So will be soon approved for symptomatic patients with functional MR who are on guided medical therapy. Very important that they all have to be on good medical therapy. TMVR devices for native mitral valve disease have potential, but they have a long way to go off. Uh, still a lot of, uh, because they are under trial. TMVR using sapien valve has been recently approved by FDA for using bioprosthetic mitral valve degeneration. Okay, for bioprosthetic mitral degeneration. TTVR devices are under early stages, but promising and dry illuminate clip tricuspid clip, very promising with uh, limited indications. So this is a structural heart webcast series which we do every uh, other month, uh, for the second Tuesday. You can go on the website and see how these procedures are being done and um, understand about that. Just to show you, this is the percutaneous heart valve center. Person is walking out and it's beeping. Sir, that alarm means the security tag is still on your new heart valve. I need to see how many new valves have you had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinney. And uh, now uh, the next one, um, Dr. John Puskas, who is the chairman of uh, cardiac surgery at uh, Mount Sinai St. Luke's. Uh, and we're lucky to have him there, uh, and we are the partners in crime uh, at St. Luke's. So uh, his topic is um, from minimally invasive to hybrid and wholly arterial. 
resurgence of uh, coronary bypass surgery. And that is what exactly he is. That is what he does on day-to-day -day basis. 500 cases this year. Thank you, John. It's um, a little bit like being the sacrificial lamb in the lion's den, being the only surgeon at an interventional cardiology congress. <laughs> but I feel I'm among friends and collaborators and colleagues. <laughs> These are my disclosures. I've served as PI or an international PI of a variety of trials, including the ongoing hybrid revascularization trial. I'm going to zip through several concepts. First, I'm going to present to you, I hope convince you that cabbage remains very important. Uh, and then we're going to tell you a little bit about cabbage and how we're trying to make it better and end with a conversation briefly about the importance of the coronary heart team. So Dr. Fuster provided me these slides back in 2012 when he presented his uh, freedom trial results um, at AHA. And the take home message is here. Among diabetic patients randomized to have PCI versus cabbage and followed for five years, there was a striking benefit in terms of the hard endpoints of death, stroke, M and MI, not repeat revascularization, just hard endpoints, death, stroke, MI, in favor of cabbage. And that difference was not seen until after two years. And then the curves uh, diverge and they continue to diverge. This is syntax five year data. <clears throat> And the five-year results of syntax, this is not just diabetic patients, patients with three vessel disease and or left main disease, randomized to have next generation uh, DES stenting. Uh, again, the outcomes were in favor for MACE, all-cause death, MI, death stroke MI, uh, in favor of cabbage over PCI. Stroke was not different at five years follow-up. Repeat revascularization again, very much in favor of cabbage. Dr. Uh, Patrick Sorois uh, provided me these uh, slides, which he presented just last Monday at TCT, uh, the 10-year outcome of the syntax trial. And he calls it syntaxes. I guess that's because only death and taxes uh, are certainties in life. Um, and uh, here you see five-year MACE, uh, PCI, uh, again, strikingly inferior to cabbage uh, for the, the whole cohort, and five-year mortality a trend towards a benefit for cabbage. At 10 year, all cause mortality was again a trend towards benefit for cabbage, but not statistically significant in the entire cohort. In three vessel disease, it was a highly significant in favor of cabbage. And I think the biggest, the, uh, there were two things that really surprised me and impressed me about syntax. Um, first was how well three vessel disease patients did with cabbage. And second was how well left main patients did with PCI. And it, it was a little counterintuitive, but actually when you think about it it, it, it makes sense. A lot of stents in small vessels is not going to end well. A short, large stent in a short, large left main may very well end well. Uh, and I think that as interventional cardiologists develop expertise in the treatment of left main, we're going to see that go the way of PCI and three vessel disease go more the way uh, of cabbage. Here you see in left main at 10 years, no difference in survival between PCI and cabbage. These are the 10 year syntax scores um, divided by uh, tercile. And you can see in the, in the left uh, for all patients, um, higher syntax scores favors cabbage, intermediate lower syntax scores, it's a wash. For three vessel disease, higher and intermediate scores favor cabbage. Lower uh, does not, uh, and um, for left main disease, it doesn't across the board, which I think is very interesting. Take home message, with only 72% of the data acquired, again, they're, they're working to acquire the other 28% now, no difference in 10-year outcome in the overall cohort, but a strikingly, benef strikingly large benefit for mortality of cabbage better than PCI for three vessel disease and similar outcomes for left main disease. So let me talk, tell you cardiologists a little bit about how I got to be here. I didn't uh, invent this sport of coronary surgery. It actually was invented in what I think of as four eras uh, by some really smart people, including Alexis Carell, one of the very few surgeons to receive the Nobel Prize. And he uh, described the concept of operating on coronary circulation and did so in dogs. 
just at the turn of the 20th century. Arthur Weinberg, a Canadian, uh, took an internal mammary graft and implanted it into the myocardium of ischemic hearts before he could make a uh, cine angiogram of their coronary arteries uh, and just basically using the, con the, the physiologic concepts. And interestingly, it actually worked. Vasily Kalasov, the Russian surgeon, actually did the first cabbage. It wasn't an American. You can worry, stop worrying about whether it was DeBakey or Cooley or Garrett or, or, or Sabaston or any of the others who've laid claim to it. It wasn't. It was this man in Moscow. Uh, and he did it in 1959 with Elite at the LAD. The Weinberg uh, was a fascinating procedure. Uh, again, he started doing this just after the Second World War, uh, and ultimately angiograms became available, and he could demonstrate, as you see on the lower right, uh, that some of these grafts just harvested from the chest wall and implanted into a slit in the ischemic myocardium, not sewn to an artery, uh, would actually canalize uh, by collaterals and ultimately provide flow to the ischemic myocardium. Rene Favalaro at the Cleveland Clinic developed the concept of using vein grafts initially as a jump to go around a lesion and then ultimately from the aorta to the distal coronary circulation, and they did a great many of them, uh, publishing this first 180 patients in 1967. Um, it wasn't long, though. This is 1970, and already uh, at the University of Geneva, pathologists are identifying the phenomenon of intimal hyperplasia in vein grafts. So within three years of the first major clinical series of vein graft cabbage, we could see what its limitation would be. And then in 1968, a man named George Green here in New York uh, performed the first internal mammary anastomosis directly to the LED um, uh, in the United States of America. I now have the job he had in 1970. So we, we see far because we stand on the shoulders of giants. These are some of the early uh, data from Floyd Loop and, and the others at the Cleveland Clinic in 1986, demonstrating that an internal mammary graft to the LED instead of a vein graft to the LED would lead to longer life for patients over 10 years. Why would that be? Uh, Renu Vermani and others looked at uh, ten, two, six, and 12-year-old grafts, uh, IMAs and vein grafts, uh, and you can see that over time, the vein grafts degenerate with intimal hyperplasia and calcification and atherogenesis, while the internal mammary grafts do not. And the basic reason for that is that the two uh, structures are not the same. The internal mammary artery and the saphenous vein graft have completely different anatomy and physiology, and in particular, the internal mammary artery produces nitric oxide and pumps it directly into the coronary circulation. So the fourth area of coronary bypass grafting, in my mind, is where we are now, or where we should be now, uh, with multiple or total arterial grafting, and you can get there two ways. Usually it requires both, uh, both uh, internal mammary arteries and radial arteries, and here you can see some of the configurations that we use on a daily basis to accomplish multiple arterial grafting. We know that two internal mammary artery grafts are better than one. These are, this is the seminal paper in 1999, for, again from the Cleveland Clinic, showing that, not, that for both survival and intervention-free survival, patients who received two mammary grafts to the left coronary system outlived those who received one. Uh, and we emphasize that with an editorial uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not long uh, thereafter, uh, but yet we don't do it very much. A meta-analysis by Takagi in 2014, again, looked at observational studies, 70,000 patients, and demonstrated a striking survival benefit of double internal mammary artery graft over long-term follow-up. And that didn't matter whether the graft was skeletonized or pedicle. These are technical terms for how we harvest it. It's just a matter of using two mammaries versus one mammary. Some years ago, I looked at the Emory database uh, where I worked at the time um, at uh, many thousands of patients who'd had single or double mammary uh, grafting. And we risk adjusted them and compared patients who had diabetes or not and received a single mammary or two mammaries. And the reason I wondered about this was because the data from the Cleveland Clinic were developed at a time when very few diabetic patients had coronary bypass surgery. In fact, there weren't many diabetic patients in America. When I started practice, the, about 14% of our patients having coronary surgery were diabetic. Now it's about 54%. So more than half of our coronary patients are diabetic, while the data that says two mammaries are better than one was developed in an era when there were very few diabetic patients having coronary surgery. So we asked the question, is, does that old truth uh, hold true now? 
Uh, as it turns out, it does, uh, perhaps even more so. The benefit of double mammography may be even greater for diabetic patients than it is for non-diabetic patients, perhaps because those internal mammographs pump out nitric oxide into the coronary circulation. Here you see survival over eight years of follow-up for several thousand patients having beta without diabetes. That's the best survival. The next best surviving group was beta patients who had diabetic diabetes, who did better than single mammary patients without diabetes. So it would appear that over follow-up, getting two mammographs at the time of your cabbage matters more than whether you have diabetes or not, which is a remarkable statement. These are data, though, from the recently completed 10-year follow-up of the ART trial provided to me by my friend and colleague David Taggart. They randomized um, over 3,000 patients, 1,500 in each uh, arm, and followed them for five, for five years and then eventually now 10 years, randomized them to have single versus double mammary grafting at the time of surgery. This is 28 cardiac centers in seven countries, 3,100 patients, and very high adherence to medical directed uh, uh, guidelines directed medical therapy. And follow-up was very good, and I'm going to show you both intention to treat and uh, as-treated analyses. And the reason the as-treated analyses are so important is because this was a rather flawed trial. 36% of patients enrolled in this trial received a somewhat different treatment than had been assigned. Specifically, 14% of patients assigned to receive double mammary grafting actually got one, and 22% of patients assigned to have single mammary grafting got that single mammary plus a radial artery graft. So here's intention to treat, with 36% of the patients not really assigned as we had hoped, no difference in survival at 10 years. But if you simply ask the question, one artery graft versus two artery grafts, a rather striking survival benefit for patients receiving more than one arterial graft. Here's death stroke MI intention to treat, no significant difference. But if you simply uh, break them out as, as treated, single versus more than one arterial graft, again, a striking benefit. So there are multiple reasons for these differences, and I mentioned to you the radial artery crossover. Uh, radial artery use and, and uh, crossover is one, but surgeon experience also seems to matter. This is a paper from that same um, uh, trial showing that a, the conversion rate, failure to do double, double mammary grafting versus single mammary grafting, ranged from zero to 100% among surgeons. So it would appear that we are not, as all, not, not all as uniformly skilled at harvesting double mammary grafts as we would like to think in the surgical community. This is the single highest volume surgeon in the ART trial, it happens to be Dr. Taggart, uh, enrolled 400 patients, half randomized to a single, half to double uh, mammary grafts, and these are the data in those 400 patients. Just 400 patients followed 10 years showed a significantly different uh, outcome in survival. So again, I mentioned the fourth era of cabbage. How do we get there? Double mammary grafts are a key part of it, but radial artery grafts may also be. And again, we didn't invent this. Dr. Carpentier was writing about this in 1973. I was 13 years old. And he has a comment here as he discusses with Dr. Green um, uh, the use of arterial conduits. Radial artery grafts were sort of rediscovered in the early 90s by Dr. Uh, Carpentier's uh, colleague, Dr. Akar. And more recently, the radio artery patency study was, was published uh, in Jack, uh, demonstrating superior patency um, with radio artery grafts versus vein grafts. We published this paper um, arguing that multiple arterial grafting should be routine uh, by noting survival over time of patients who receive radio artery in addition to vein, uh, in addition to internal mammary arteries versus vein in addition to internal mammary artery grafts. Most recently, uh, and I think quite importantly, the radial artery has um, undergone a careful analysis. There were six individual randomized controlled trials, all somewhat underpowered, that compared internal mammary graft to the LED with veins versus internal mammary artery graft to the LED, radial artery graft to the next most important target, and then veins. Six trials, all relatively underpowered, but they, the leaders of those trials all agreed to provide patient-level data for a meta-analysis, and this is the meta-analysis of that patient-controlled data presented just very recently um, at the AATS and published in the New England Journal. At five years, death stroke MI strongly favored radio artery patients. Angiographic graft failure failed, favored uh, radio artery patients, 
and repeat revascularization failed, favored those patients who received our second arterial conduit with a radial artery. And I was privileged to be part of this uh, uh, investigative group. So taking the concept of a second arterial graft further to total arterial re revascularization, Dr. Buxton and his group in Australia have actually led this uh, concept for more than 20 years and demonstrated this uh, survival curve among a large population of patients in Australia. Uh, that's to say, total arterial grafting outperforms single mammary grafting with veins. And we, in our own guidelines, acknowledge that a, a complete arterial grafting may be reasonable, but there's no strong push towards it. While the push towards it is stronger in the European guidelines, uh, which mention total arterial revascularization as a should be considered in patients with good life expectancy. What is the status presently in the STS database? Well, we finally made it to almost every patient getting a single arterial bypass graft, an internal mammary, but only 5% of patients having coronary bypass in the United States of America get a double mammary graft. 19 out of 20 do not. And I think that's shameful. And the shame rests in the ha uh, on the surgeons. You as cardiologists should not send patients to surgeons who won't do two mammary grafts for the patients. Just say no. Tell them to up their game. Radio artery graft use has actually declined uh, over time, probably because we didn't have a trial demonstrating survival benefit. Now we do. I hope that will change. But again, surgeons are not generally putting their best foot forward. There are some reasons for that that we could talk about, uh, but part of it's training, part of it's time in the OR, part of it's a rigid focus on very short-term metrics with no credit given to surgeons. Uh, for longer term survival. One of the things we've worked hard to do at St. Luke's is to reduce the stroke risk. This is the one year data from Syntax, which showed a striking, uh, wor strikingly worse stro uh, stroke outcome for cabbage versus PCI at one year. That didn't hold through five or 10 years of follow up, but there was a benefit of PCI over cabbage for stroke, and that was also seen in the Freedom trial, where the stroke risk was about twice as high with cabbage. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, this is a very short video loop that shows you how long it takes to make an um, ultrasound image of the ascending aorta during heart surgery. And you can find things like this and avoid applying a clamp or a heart-lung machine to an aorta with a uh, walloping dose of calcium like that. Even this uh, medial thickening, which is sometimes soft toothpaste-like debris, can be avoided, but not if you rely on your fingers. You can't feel that, which is on the back wall of the aorta. Uh, only the stuff that's on the front wall, and it takes the ultrasound to demonstrate it. it. That is something that should be routine, is not routine in most centers. Um, back in 14, we published a, a retrospective look at 10,000 patients uh, and concluded that the more you manipulate the aorta, the more strokes you have. So in on-pump surgery, we'd like to use a single clamp instead of two clamps. In an off-pump surgery, we'd like, like to avoid a clamp altogether and cut stroke risk dramatically. We also in insist on making sure that every graft is patent before the patient leaves the operating room. This is a new technology that we can use. It's transit time flow measurement. Um, and this device can be placed across or around a uh, bypass graft to document the flow uh, in the graft. The, at the bottom of the slide, you see some images that are produced by an imaging probe that actually can make a picture of the anastomosis if you have any questions or concerns. So we are scrupulous in interrogating every graph. We don't assume it's perfect until we've shown ourselves that it's perfect. And we get this uh, data printed up on a console in the operating room like this. Another thing we'd like to do, and I think it's very important that we have the engagement of our cardiology colleagues to accomplish this, is to insist that every patient who has coronary bypass surgery also gets optimal medical therapy. It's not one or the other. They should always go together. It matters that the patient who's had cabbage also gets best medical therapy. It makes a difference in survival. It makes a difference in graft patency, and it makes a difference in survival. And dual antiplatelet therapy is part of that. So dual antiplatelet therapy improves uh, vein graft patency and reduces adverse events uh, in coronary bypass patients without a significant increase uh, in uh, bleeding episodes. So how do we improve off-pump bypass? Part of it is patient selection and expectation. Off-pump bypass disproportionately benefits high-risk patients. There is not a survival benefit for off-pump bypass compared to on-pump bypass in low-risk patients, but there is in high-risk patients, and the higher the predicted risk of mortality, the greater the benefit of avoiding the heart-lung machine. 
that again, if for instance, you were to enroll only low risk patients in an off pump, on pump trial, it wouldn't matter how many you enrolled, you would not demonstrate a survival benefit because there isn't one in low risk patients. We looked at uh, the national STS database um, to see which high risk patients would benefit. And I was particularly interested to notice whether females who are high risk for cabbage in general would benefit from off pump surgery um, more than males. It turns out they do. Uh, and that off-pump bypass had 30-day benefits for death stroke, MI, and MACE across the board. When we went to the whole national STS database, um, uh, again, uh, almost a million patients, you got a curve very much like what we got at Emory, uh, which was for low-risk patients, no difference in off-pump versus on-pump, and for higher-risk patients, an accelerating or increasing benefit. But again, we have to minimize the more manipulation of the order to reduce risk of stroke. This is a, patient, a paper from Circulation in 2012 comparing um, two different ways of attaching a graft to the aorta, one with a clamp, one without a clamp, and look at these odds ratios for mortality and stroke, cutting risk of, of, of stroke by something like three quarters. And a meta-analysis finding something very similar. And there's a reason for that. Uh, this is a, a rather nice, small, but physiologic study of transcranial Doppler of the middle cerebral artery during the construction of proximal anastomoses in 42 patients, uh, randomly assigned to have a side-biting clamp, the most manipulation, uh, or this facilitated anastomotic device that we use now, the, the heart string device. Um, and I'm going to show you what that heart string is. This is an interesting little device. It's called the heart string because it's made of string that uh, sticks to itself. You pop it into the hole in the aorta. It opens up and creates a relatively bloodless field where you can suture a graft of the aorta without having manipulated or clamped the aorta, and then you unstring it. And there you are. You have the thing completely done without a clamp on the aorta. So that allows us to do um, an all arterial or mini arterial operation without manipulating the aorta. Because that's the key to stroke in cardiac surgery, is manipulation of the aorta. The more we do, uh, the more strokes we have, the less that we do, the less strokes we have. Uh, and we see this again in another paper from Europe, uh, Edelman in 2012, comparing what's called an aortic off-pump bypass, meaning no touch of the aorta, hanging all the grafts off the internal mammary arteries, versus side-biting clamp or conventional cabbage. And in each comparison, the less manipulation of the aorta, the less uh, stroke. So we did this meta-analysis, recently published in JAK, of about 40,000 patients who had on-pump, off-pump with a partial clamp, off-pump with that heart string device, or truly an aortic off-pump, no aortic touch technique. And here you see, for stroke, the an aortic, meaning no aortic touch technique, outperformed standard cabbage on-pump by almost 80% reduction in stroke risk, and about a 50% reduction in mortality risk. So these are striking benefits of reducing the manipulation of the aorta at the time of coronary bypass surgery. This is what it would look like, and this is what we do on a very regular basis, as regularly as last evening. Um, two mammary arteries harvested and a radial artery used to extend to graft down here to the PDA, uh, another radial artery, the other bit of that radi same radial artery off the Lita uh, to the circumflex system. You can get three or four or even five arterial outflows with two arterial inflows and no manipulation of a diseased aorta. There's a different configurations of how you can put the, the conduits together to get outflow. One has to think one's way through this carefully, thinking about the asymmetries of competitive flow and choosing the graft pattern. Uh, but these are all feasible if you really devote yourself to this kind of surgery. And here's a center in Dusseldorf, just published very, very recently in JGCVS. Uh, that made the decision to switch from a conventional on-pump technique to an anaortic off-pump technique. Um, Alexander Albert is actually a very nice guy, uh, but apparently in Germany, since he's the chief, he can just tell every other surgeon exactly how to do the operation, and they either have to do it or leave. Um, uh, and I mean, I know Alex, he's a really nice guy, but he just tell, he told me, we just, I, I made the decision and that was that. And I said, what would happen if the guys didn't toe the line? He said, they'd have to leave. Okay, um, so, but look what happened. Uh, he goes from all on pump uh, clamped cases to an aortic off pump uh, and cuts his stroke rate by about 70%. And this is, it was early strokes that were reduced, not late strokes as much. So around 2005, he made this decision and then followed his trends in his department 
Anaerobic upgab got almost to 100%, and the stroke risk went down by about two thirds to three quarters. And it was mostly a reduction in early stroke with anaerobic upgab that made the difference. So I think the clampless, no air to touch, all arterial opcab is state-of-the-art cabbage, but it's very technically demanding. This is not a straightforward operation. And frankly, it requires a really dedicated surgical team to get it done reliably and reproducibly. This is what's happening in the, na in the nation. About 12.5% of cases are done off-pump, let alone anaortic off-pump. How about robotic technique? Now, hybrid therapy is something that we've partnered with uh, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Kinney, um, uh, Dr. Sweeney and others here at Sinai and of course with Pedro Moreno and his team at St. Luke's as well. Um, it's the intended combination of minimally invasive surgery with PCI to non-LED lesions. I'm going to show you two quick cases. One is two vessel disease involving the proximal LED in a person who refused uh, transfusion or sternotomy. Um, this is the proximal LED uh, lesion as you can see there uh, and there's also a type A lesion in the mid right coronary. This is the OR setup. Um, we have the robot there wrapped up in sterile plastic, uh, the patient on the table, uh, and um, I end up sitting at that console over there in the corner uh, to do the procedure. We insert the trocars in the second, fourth, and sixth intercostal spaces and then connect the robot to them. And then we introduce the instruments through the trocars. I sit down at this console and I am now seeing inside the chest in 3D high def um, with the ability to magnify as I choose uh, and focus and zoom. And these instruments that you're seeing there are, are a little wider than your cross pen. Uh, inside the chest, one of the instruments, of course, is a high def camera. With those instruments, uh, which uh, translate the motions of my hands and feet, uh, we're able to harvest the internal memory already much as we would do in an open chest environment. Uh, frankly, with even better visualization. Uh, here's a split screen view of the procedure being performed. The team in the OR also gets to see it. Uh, th this thing is called a robot, uh, but actually it has no autonomy whatsoever. It's really a telemanipulator. It only does what we do sitting at the console, translates the motions of my hands and feet. There's some pedals down below uh, that control various things. Uh, and we finally harvest the mammary artery, divide it, leave it tethered to the pericardium. And then um, we use a special, uh, use that camera to pick the right spot uh, for the internal mammary artery incision. We make a little incision between, typically between the nipple and the sternum in a male. Uh, we, you can see us with the needle identifying just the right spot. Where are we going to come down uh, onto the, the target? Uh, this incision, you'll see the size of it's about three and a half uh, centimeters. You see my fingertips there. And now under direct vision, we're suturing that internal mammary artery uh, to the LAD. Once that LED is uh, completed under direct vision, um, we test the flow in it with a flow meter um, and then close up these little incisions. Here's the flow in the flow meter. Uh, again, we, we have quality assessment on every graft, every case, no exceptions. Uh, the next stage is to shoot the graft, with, uh, demonstrate the patency of the internal mammary, and then stent the uh, right cornea and get a beautiful result like that. Second case is left main. Um, in a laborer, refuse a sternotomy. Here's the left main and prox LED stenosis. You can see a typical, this could be a bifurcating stent. Uh, the other option would be to uh, do an internal mammary graft to the LED uh, and then have a protected left main opportunity for stenting uh, into the circumflex. And we chose the latter. Here you see the side view uh, of the distal left main stent, uh, le distal left main uh, lesion. Um, here's the internal mammary graft done. And then a nice short stent from the left main into the circumflex, jailing the LED, and a beautiful result uh, for that. So now the patient's revascularized with one short, large stent that has a very high likelihood of perfect patency. And he goes home day three. Here he is at one month uh, with a minimal uh, sort of defect in his chest. And in, as I get close to concluding here, I want to talk briefly about the hybrid trial. This is something I have the privilege of leading here with uh, uh, other members of the Mount Sinai community um, in the Data Coordinating Center. The purpose of this trial is to test the safety and efficacy of hybrid revascularization compared to multivessel stenting in patients with limited coronary disease that includes either distal left main disease or proximal LED disease. 
we're going to roll 2,300 patients in about 100 centers in Europe and Asia, excuse me, in North America and Europe. Um, we're just now getting off the ground. We've enrolled 150 thus far. The primary endpoint will be five-year MACE. This is a superiority trial. Patients can enter with a qualifying angiogram um, uh, at the time of a stable diagnosis or with a PCI angiogram at the time of a STEMI or NSTEMI from the right or circumflex. I'm going to skip through some of these selection criteria. It's basically all the people that you would expect. Um, the purpose of this trial, uh, for the purposes of this trial, we're using off-pump minimally invasive sternal sparing revascularization, typically mid-cab or robotic mid-cab, but we have now allowed off-pump bypass for the single vessel disease as well. The primary endpoint is MACE at five years. Secondary endpoints are all those things that you would expect, including the individual components of MACE. And I, I emphasize that this is a cardiology trial, essentially. Uh, here at Sinai, Simeon Sharma and Apurna Kinney are leading the group. At St. Luke's, uh, Pedro Moreno. At Beth Israel, John Fox. Uh, and at each of the centers around the country and in Europe, we're looking to have um, aggressive and active engagement of the cardiology community in this trial. Um, these are typically low syntax score patients commonly treated with PCI, and they're always originating in the cath lab and ending in the cath lab. So great idea, sounds like a great thing. Here's the reality check. Robotic surgery is less than one, well, it's 1.1% of all cabbage in America presently done by robotic technique. I mentioned the importance of um, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and uh, optimal medical therapy. I'm gonna show you one slide uh, looking at uh, several centers uh, in Florida with um, optimal, optimal medical therapy versus not. And both, lip, both aspirin usage and lipid lowering agents impact MACE during long-term follow-up of cabbage patients quite dramatically. So please, let's keep the optimal medical therapy for our patients. And we do that through a heart team uh, as we try to do all of our activities through a heart team. Um, the coronary heart team actually preceded the structural heart team by about 20 years. Although I have to say, um, it's recently reinvigorated by the notice of these sorts of differences across countries. Here's PCI to cabbage ratios ranging from less than one to more than eight in different countries that are all developed. Different states and different locations, PCI per 100,000 and cabbage per 100,000, highly heterogeneous. And rates of inappropriateness randomly varying in dramatic fashion between different countries and different times. So we think of the heart team approach as being data driven. We really do believe in calculating the STS and the syntax scores for patients. I think of the heart team decision making as a three step process. First, the coronary lesions then the patient's comorbidities, that's the STS score, and then a conversation. My personal bias, and I'll put it right out there, I think we do too much PCI in young patients who would benefit from multiple arterial conduits, and I think we do too much cabbage in frail elderly people who meet guidelines, criteria for cabbage, but would be just as well or perhaps better off with a limited revascularization by PCI. I think the hybrid therapy is perhaps the greatest opportunity to collaborate in the cath lab and in the surgical arena for patients with coronary disease, uh, neither the surgeon nor cardiologist loses and the patient may be the biggest winner. So in conclusion, I, I think that we can see cabbage is uh, an important part of the armamentarium. There are ways in which cabbage can be made better than it is on average, but those ways are not applied routinely across the country. We're working very hard to make them a routine thing in our practice with a goal of a zero elective cabbage mortality and near zero repeat revascularization. Thank you. And now I invite uh, Manny and uh, all three uh, with a great uh, lecture, particularly putting the, all the advances of cabbage. Uh, and um, so I think uh, we start. Uh, any questions, uh, please come to the mic and uh, um, send it. So this is a question for Dr. Keeney that for tower patients, how would you decide? on the type of valve to use, core valve versus adverse sapien? Uh, patient as a workup will have a CT scan, and on the CT scan you decide the annulus size of the iota and amount of calcium involved. Based on that, the decision will be made what is the kind of valve patient will get. And also, um, like I mentioned, majority of these patients should get transfemoral um, root for a tower, so if there is if the transfemoral, depending on the size of the uh, femoral artery also will decide what is the kind of valve will be used. 
So I mean, actually, there are few tri trials have been done. Uh, the choice trial and the uh, latest uh, data presented, they kind of equal in majority of the time. Uh, but one good advantage still remains for the core valve that the sheath size needed is about like your femoral artery, about five millimeter. Uh, and uh, for, the, for the sapient, you need minimum six millimeter. So clearly vascular si sometimes uh, make the decision, but all, all, overall there are two small trials have been done. And uh, the, if you take an endpoint, so one of the trial actually is the choice trial where they make the endpoint of uh, aortic or prosthetic regurgitation as a death, a stroke, and prosthetic regurgitation. So clearly you leave a little more AI uh, with the core valve. So clearly they lost uh, from that point of view, but the hard end point of the death and uh, MI were equal. Uh, and uh, so now, uh, so I think both are equal. So we do make a decision. Uh, there are some new data now that Sapien may have slightly lower CVA rate. So that is one of the choice which we did in our group. We did see uh, slightly higher uh, CVA rate with the core valve the way it is, uh, it goes through the arch, uh, and uh, patients who have prior, uh, clearly the CVA, so we prefer, uh, or we selectively um, select, I would say, the sapien valve. And the last one, which was the part of uh, uh, Dr. Keeney's paper was the coronary access. If you need to go back into the uh, coronary patient with young age or who have multiple PCIs, the core valve is a very tough uh, to engage, although can be done, but angiography is very difficult to go through the core valve while it's easier with the um, sapien valve because the usually coronaries remain above. Although acutely, the coronary obstruction is higher with the sapien valve. But of course, you have technique how to avoid the obstruction, but uh, so and so forth. So question for Dr. Puskas, do you routinely use FFR for cabbage as graft survival has been shown uh, affected by inappropriate FFR? That's a very interesting question. The, the way that we should interpret FFR data in guiding cabbage is entirely unknown. What we do know is that doing PCI for FFR negative lesions leads to negative outcomes. We also know that vessels that aren't very tightly stenosed that receive a coronary bypass graft are more likely to have that graft close over time. But the consequences of closing a vein graft that you didn't really need are usually clinically silent. They don't produce any negative adverse event. Whereas, in fact, most of those grafts will actually stay open, and certainly arterial grafts may stay open. So I'm very, very cautious in extrapolating from FAME to cabbage practice. FAME was about how to improve PCI, not how to improve cabbage. We don't have a trial yet. Uh, to tell us what to do with a borderline FFR lesion uh, in a patient who's going to go to cabbage. We still fundamentally use um, visual angiography to guide cabbage choices. Um, it may help us, FFR data may help us choose between a vein or arterial graft or lima versus a radial artery graft. The radial arteries are a little more prone to competitive flow than internal mammary grafts. Um, but Fundamentally, at this point, we don't really have data to guide us in directing cabbage practice by FFR data. Yeah, and actually that goes with the, the ongoing uh, FAME 3 trial, uh, comparing uh, PCI uh, with FFR guidance uh, with multivessel disease against cabbage. And in that, the cabbage decision is done by the angiogram, right. not by the FFR. So clearly I say that, you know, while we have, uh, and of course part of my, uh, presentation will be on this FFR, um, that while we really kind of uh, make our decision in the cath lab, not necessarily from surgical point of view. Uh, then, uh, Dr. Keeney, are your patients without CAD after AS uh, got the tower? Should they be on statin or not? Yeah, interesting question. No data to support that patients after tower, like you mentioned, without CAD should be on statin or not. Uh, however, and we know that patients who have had, uh, you know, calcific aortic stenosis, uh, initial data to say that they are to be on statin to uh, slow the progression of uh, aortic valve disease. So they remain on statin, and unless, you know, there's no contraindication, suppose a guy is 75, normal coronaries, um, and he has been on statin already, no, you know, you would not want to change after having had a tower. 
But what is more important, we need to know is what is the DAPT that you're going to give patients mm. after you're uh, being on uh, tower. And a lot of uh, studies uh, did show recently during uh, ESC that um, you know there was a question whether they have to be on anticoagulation or no, uh, independent of being uh, uh, having uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, the final consensus is say uh, same that you know you should be on the DAPT, which is Plavix and aspirin, probably for six months, and after that you can stop the Plavix, only remain on the uh, aspirin. Yeah. So I, I mean, I personally, who is 88 year old, 85, and no CAD, and we put a tower. Um, I, unlikely this statin is going to prevent the tower degeneration. So I personally don't give it. So again, there is no guidance compared to you know PCI trials. Uh, all the mentioned, the freedom syntax, they require actually before PCI uh, and of course before cabbage that you give high dose statins, more so for the PCI in the XL trial. All patients receive 80 milligram of torvastatin or 40 of uh, Crestor, but uh, definitely from the valve, it is not mandated that you need to give pre or post. So with that, uh, there are a lot of other questions coming up, but maybe I ask uh, many a practical question and we just had a trouble. Uh, you know, troublesome patient a few days ago, 94 year old, uh, he's a lawyer by profession, still works. Wow. Uh, didn't have any much, uh, no some aortic stenosis, uh, had uh, now having shortness of breath. Tremendous, we used to walk six, seven block, became one block. Echo was done, so maybe mild to moderate aortic stenosis, little bit of uh, um, the, the MAC, maybe some mitral stenosis, and uh, clearly these patients, uh, you, you, once though that's symptomatic, they come to the cath lab because don't get any functional study. So I did the cath, coronaries are non-obstructive, so that is fine. The gradient is 22 peak, aortic gradient, and uh, 16 uh, mean, uh, with the PA pressure moderately elevated, mean PA about uh, 30, 50 over 25, and cardiac output was 2.8, index is 1.3, and mitral was about four millimeter gradient, so mitral valve area came out to be like 1.9. Aortic valve area came out to be 1.2. So this is now by definition low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. Now patient is symptomatic. By any criteria was Dr. Keeney showed, I mean, does it, it doesn't fit. So what to do? We told the patient, well, you know, nothing, not much wrong with you, you're not happy. He said, of course something wrong with me because I'm Declining in the last two months, I cannot perform two, three months what I used to do before. So then question was, what should we do in this particular case? We have not done any CAT scan or anything. On the NGO, uh, you can see the calcific aortic valve. So what should we do to really label this patient symptomatic, significant, or severe aortic stenosis? I think there are uh, two things. One, there is a clear subset of patients in the, in the flow chart I showed low gradient, low flow, severe aortic stenosis, one group of patients that get that are those patients with moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension, especially those with increased PVR. Um, and that in affects their flow. That's a nice uh, uh, paper from Mayo that shows these patients don't do very well and they require AVR if aortic stenosis is the lesion we think is causing their symptoms. The second thing to do is, because it's low flow, it is worth increasing the flow across the aortic valve, either dobutamine or exercise. And you may be able to demonstrate that these gradients actually go up significantly. The problem with exercise, which is much more physiological, is it's hard to get good Doppler signals as they come off the treadmill. It's usually not very good. So I would say either bicycle exercise, which we do a lot. We have switched entirely from um, treadmill exercise, if it's not for symptoms, to bicycle exercise, or dobutamine, because you have some ability to increase that cardiac output, and you may actually see the gradient go up. That might clinch the issue um, in this patient. So anything with the TE, if let's say the valve is not moving, or opening, or, or on the CT, some uh, calcium marker that... Uh, if if the, cal the valve looks heavily calcified, it's worth doing a CT calcium score, because that gives you one more um, index by which you can say, he, he or she has severe aortic stenosis. I think the problem with TE is it's hard to planimetry the valve, even with TE, with that amount of calcification, if it's a truly classified valve. And the last thing is anatomic valve area has been debunked as a good index for severe aortic stenosis. So I'm not really sure that's very helpful with TE. Okay. Um, John, for, uh, what is the recommendation for aspirin and Plavix after cabbage? 
Great question. Um, you know, our guidelines uh, haven't caught up with some of the uh, other data, more recent data. Uh, we habitually give aspirin alone for patients who have had on-pump cabbage. Um, for most of our patients who have off-pump cabbage, we give them dual antiplatelet therapy for six months to a year and then aspirin for life thereafter. I think you have to parse out the risks and benefits. Plavix is not without risk. We know that in the cardiology community, patients with stents do better with dual antiplatelet therapy and there's some push towards shorter duration now of, of the Plavix um, to reduce risk of bleeding. So we're trying to follow suit with that, I think, in this arena. Uh, we're treating two things. We're treating the inherent cardiovascular disease of the patient that brought them to the cath lab or to the cabbage operating room. We're also treating the thrombogenicity of a stent or a fresh bypass graft. And obviously one is a long-term risk, that's the pathophysiology of the patient, and one is a shorter-term risk, the thrombogenicity of a new stent or a new bypass graft. So we're tailoring the Plavix around the short-term risk and trusting in the aspirin for the long-term risk without a lot of good data. Okay. So uh, another question for you. Uh, what is the difference in the patency rates of REMA versus a REMA extended with a radial artery? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the anastomotic stenosis risk? Good question. Uh, I think the honest truth is it depends who's creating the anastomosis. And, and that sound, may sound uh, self-serving, but I think it's just fundamentally true. Uh, and that, that's a big part of our problem in, in surgery is heterogeneity and, and expertise. Um, we have had um, very good success, uh, and, I, and I literally cannot recall any case that's come back because of failure of an extended graft. Um, when we sew one artery to the other, we do so very carefully with the spatulated anastomosis. It's actually bigger than the arter arterial lumen itself. Where we have had a few problems is in underestimating the importance of asymmetry in competitive flow in multiple coronary artery targets. If you're going to have one inflow from an internal mammary and two or three or four outflows, what will happen due to competitive flow in each of those coronary artery targets and how will that impact the patency of some portion of that composite conduit? So the more complex your coronary and anatomic or anastomotic technique is, the more things you have to think about. Getting to a purely two mammary inflow, no aortic touch, means you've got two inflows and maybe three, four, five outflows. That's why we have often still used the heart string device to put a radio artery on the aorta or a vein graft on the aorta and a radio artery on the hood of that vein graft so that we get a third and or fourth inflow to simplify the process. But the short, short answer to the question, what is the patency of a radio artery extension from an internal mammary versus the internal mammary? There are no randomized trials uh, to demonstrate that. There isn't a, there isn't a data-driven answer to the question. We believe it's as good as um, the native vessel, but that's not proven. Great. Now, Anu, a question for you. Uh, which is superior in determining the significance of a lesion between FFR, IVAS, or OCT? So FFR is uh, truly a physiological uh, test and probably the best test that if you are not sure, you see uh, after coronary angiography, you see, see a lesion uh, which is you know, intermediate and you're not sure what to do with this, uh, that patient, probably the physiological test is uh, indicated. There are certain parts of the coronary artery where we think uh, that FFR should not be done and probably should be some other imaging which could be IVUS, should be IVUS, that is if you're doing a left main um, or you have previous stent and you're coming back with stent blockage, then you want to see what is the cause of the blockage. Is it the intimal hyperplasia of the stent or stent under expansion? That's the time you would want to do IVUS. Now OCT is uh, the new kid around the block um, it's essentially like a black and white TV, which is IVAS versus a color TV, OCT, which is definitely has a, um, you know, a better images that you can see because the penetration um, is better there. Uh, penetration, no, but your resolution is better with OCT. You're really able to see uh, nice pictures, but no data to show outcome related uh, to OCT. So right now, majority of the reason the OCT is being uh, done is all under uh, 
uh, in trial where there is a FFR and uh, OCT comparison trial going on. So when the results are out, we will know uh, which would be better. Till then, I would still say go with the uh, FFR or uh, IVAS. Yeah, I think that's the right statement because OCT still, uh, there are a few data which actually have shown the OCT measures the lumen almost one millimeter smaller than the IVAS. So if you go with the criteria of the IVAS, which have been shown, correlate with the MACE, that your non-left main, four millimeter square, and left main, six millimeter square. So anything lesser than that is associated with a bad outcome at follow-up. So with the OCT, the number may be even one uh, millimeter lower. But clearly, I think as uh, mentioned, the left main, I would say we rely more on the IVAS, and non-left main will be more FFR, right? Yeah. Okay, so I think with the, that note, I have one uh, question. sorry, there are a few questions coming. Yes. Uh, to Dr. Kinney, in a younger patient, relatively young patient, 70 year old, how do you decide between a mechanical valve versus tower with a low risk STS score? Uh, right now, low risk, like I just showed you, the trial has been completed, so we'll have to wait till we have the trial. Uh, intermediate result. risk. Yeah, so intermediate risk, I think, if the patient is truly intermediate risk, then you have to have a discussion with the patient family and uh, that's when you have to make a decision. I think is the same. If intermediate risk, you have complex CAD and if a heart team discussion has happened, you can decide that whether you can go for either surgery or tower, but most likely will uh, tower is probably a better uh, outcome. So mechanical aortic valve, oh. uh, I'm discussing between mechanical aortic valve versus tower which is a bioprosthetic valve in a relatively patient with a low STS score or intermediate risk. In a younger patient, would you prefer mechanical aortic valve or I tower? don't know if anybody is doing mechanical aortic valve. We can ask a doctor, uh, mm -hmm. Puskas. You, you, you've, raised, you've raised a fascinating question. In the excitement about TAVR, and it is an exciting technology, we've completely forgotten that it's a biological prosthesis. Right? And as we go into lower risk patients, we're typically going into younger patients where we surgeons didn't used to put biological valves. Now we're gonna put a biological valve because it's a TAVR. And then you have to ask yourself, if you're a, six, if you're a 40 year old German getting an AVR, you have about a 50-50 chance of getting a TAVR now. It's amazing, but true, right? That's true, right? That's a true yes. statement. So that's a biological prosthesis, and we don't have data beyond five years follow-up to know how long it's going to last. You put it in a healthy 40-year-old, now you're pro almost certainly, unless this guy gets hit by um, you know, somebody on the Audubon, uh, that 40-year-old German is going to have another TAVR, a TAVR in TAVR. We talked about the concern about uh, coronary obstruction. We didn't talk about TAVR in TAVR and the gradients that are left. But if you're 40, you're not gonna have one extra tower, you're gonna have two. Uh, if I continue to practice long enough, I think I'm gonna be busy taking out stacks of tavers inside patients, <laughs> aortic roots. And then the question is relevant, what if that German had just had an onyx valve, a mechanical valve, that can be implanted with a 1% surgical risk in a guy who's 40 years old, and that can have a, be managed safely with an INR of between 1.5 and 2.0 with a baby aspirin, with a very low stroke or, or bleeding risk, would he have been better off with that as his first and only procedure? Or a TAVR, another TAVR, maybe another TAVR, and then a surgical operation? Yeah, so I think uh, younger the age, you go more mechanical. Older the age, you go a TAVR. No, no, in between, uh, make a decision. <laughs> no, the question is, the, yeah. in, your, in the low risk case, patients who went for a SAVR, what did they get? No, they all were uh, given the, um, the uh, bioprosthetic surgical valve. All the comparisons have been biological, yeah. which is yeah. you know, fair because it's, it's, it's a biological versus a biological. I think that's not unethical, but somehow we've forgotten about the mechanical option, which was the norm for 30 years. And we have better mechanical valves now than we ever have. Yeah. What about a Ross procedure? I have a patient 20 years out from a Ross procedure, four millimeter gradient across the pulmonic, and you know the mean gradient across the aortic valve is like 10 or 12 millimeters. Right. Of their native, you know. The Ross procedure um, is an extraordinarily operator-dependent procedure. 
There are literally about half a dozen people in the United States that do it really expertly. Yeah. And within the STS database, it represents about 1% of all aortic valve replacements. And the mortality for those patients is about threefold what it is for case matched or risk matched routine um, uh, cases. So the problem is that the occasional Ross surgeon doesn't do a great job. He does a much better job with a straight up mechanical valve. Um, I think if you're going to send your patient for a Ross procedure, it should be to someone who's done hundreds, plural, and makes it the focus of their career. Sending a patient to me for a Ross would be silly. Send your patient to me for four arteriographs. But the Ross surgeon should not be the guy that gets the case that needs four arteriographs either because he's not going to do a good job doing that. We're in an era of super specialization to get great results in these complex procedures. I think a ROS is as complex as a four arteriograft operation, and most surgeons can't do either. Yep. Now, maybe I think maybe concluding is the, there is a the recent paper which have made a big waves and lot in the, our cardiology and the, I'm sure surgical community uh, with the Jack uh, paper about off pump and off on and off pump uh, cabbage and showing uh, the New Jersey database uh, bad outcome or worse outcome on off pump versus on pump. You want to be definitely need to hear your comment on it because the reason is I just came from India. We had a big conference uh, and uh, there, you know, India as such as a country, 90% surgeries are done off pump and of the 90, 60% are arterial revascularization what uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Puskas does. Very few people do multiple arterial revascularization here in the United States and they usually there is various techniques, but, but one of them very common is the lima rima Y. Right. They will cut the rima, attach to the lima, and all of them, lima will get an LED diagonal, rima will get to OM, OM2, and the PDA. But the right. question is the off and off pump bypass. Yeah, I, yeah, there are so many problems with that paper published by renowned mitral valve surgeons yeah. um, <laughs> that um, uh, it, it, we don't have time to begin. But there, there, are, there are deep problems with using an administrative database to do, uh, to compare clinical outcomes. Um, you're talking about risk adjusting patients, but you don't have the risk factors to do the adjustment. Um, in every analysis of the STS database, patients having off pump surgery have more higher risk than patients having on pump surgery. That's why they were done off pump to try to mitigate against that risk. But if you're trying to compare outcomes between those groups, you've really got to have those risk factors available to you to do the, the risk adjustment. And it, with an administrative database, you don't have that. The paper published, for instance, the statements in the abstract that were risk adjusted as best they could, and then they, their key figure was the unadjusted comparison of outcomes over 10 years between those two populations of patients. If you just went to, the, to any uh, center that tracked their patients and looked at survival of off-pump versus on-pump patients, we tend to do the risk, highest risk patients off-pump. They're often sent to us for that purpose. The, no one lives forever. Uh, I published a paper about f eight years ago that simply looked at the predictive ability of the STS risk algorithm to predict 10-year survival. The R is 0.89. That's to say that those same factors that predict your 30-day mortality after cabbage also predict how long you're going to live. Sick people don't live as long as healthy people. And if you're doing off-pump surgery for your sick patients and on-pump surgery for your less sick patients and you can't risk adjust and then you present unadjusted data for 10-year follow-up, guess what you're gonna find? Yep. Okay, all, all right, I think with that note, uh, we conclude this uh, uh, afternoon session. And uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Puskas, Dr. Mani Venan, and Dr. Keeney for a great presentation and discussion. Before the day ends, one more lecture, and then after that will be a raffle, and I think we have the, uh, I want you to stay, because so I want somebody to go home with the, uh, it's the iPad uh, Pro. So that person who's going to stay here, going to go home with it. So it's a good one. So maybe it's a little. For keeping the, uh, the audience here. So anyway, so let me just take, take you through uh, our international cardiology advances, uh, which uh, we all always give tribute to Andreas Grunswick, uh, who is the father of angioplasty, where catheter-based percutaneous treatment of vascular disease in alert and awake patient, 
And of course, we know now uh, many of that, uh, the valve replacement, particularly tower, are being discharged within 24 hours. And of course, safety is the one which we really ha added on. So basically, advances based on the, the significance, observation, widespread acceptance, and change in the clinical practice. I'll start with recurrent DES ISR. Patients, uh, our usual treatment, we put a drug looting stand for these patients. There are few trials uh, knowing that uh, patients who come back with the ISR, the various factors, whether it's the stent related, biological related, uh, so and so forth. And of course, it's a little different for the BMS versus DES and various techniques have been tried, which is the balloon angioplasty, uh, drug coated balloon or drug eluting stent uh, the, for treatment of these patients. And there is a whole uh, series of treatment which can be done for patients who have come back with the drug DES ISR. So some studies have compared, which is the second stent versus drug eluting balloon and showed that the earlier generation um, in the uh, early studies that uh, second stent was better uh, than the drug eluting balloon. So latest trial in the same field, the paclitaxel eluting balloon uh, versus Everlimus eluting, the DARE, uh, DARE trial of about 270 patients basically showed kind of a similar outcome, maybe slightly better uh, with the DES uh, event rate, but uh, overall seems to be in the current day and age, the way drug coated balloons are being used, the equal outcome. The, there was a second study say that what if you use a cutting balloon along with the drug coated balloon and basically showed that once you use a scoring balloon you have a little better outcome. Again, uh, it's not a significant but uh, numerically a little better outcome compared to just use a regular balloon uh, before the drug coated balloon. The, besides the Texas drug coated balloon, there is a serolimus coated balloon which is getting into the trials seems to be more promising than, uh, uh, than the uh, earlier drug coated balloon of the paclitaxel. So where do we use drug coated balloon? I think in a smaller vessels, bifurcation, where there are multiple stents, because you don't want to put a more stent if there's already two layers and so, uh, the re-DES in a large vessel is the right approach. What we have been doing is the brachytherapy. And brachytherapy, because you used to do it in the past, but then the trials compared brachytherapy against DES, and uh, DES was better, so it's kind of uh, became obsolete. But it has has got the resurgence. We started doing in 2012, and every year do about 60, 70 uh, cases of brachytherapy, and the protocol clearly is that patient has to have at least two layers of DES, and then has a third plus restenosis. Many of them have three layers, and this actually paper, our experience of first, the drug-coated patients, uh, uh, sorry, the IVBT, uh, experience of 131 patients compared to control during the same time period where we did not use the IVBT but patient either had a re-PTCA and uh, rotablation or another stent. The, if you use a control 38% restenosis rate which became half with the IVBT. So clearly IVBT came winner and there was no late thrombosis which have been an issue in the past. So clearly we keep for patients who have multiple uh, stents at least one to two times re getting IVBT, of course, many of these patients can go for coronary artery bypass surgery. Second is the calcific lesion, always a trouble for us, and we have various trials uh, to take care of those lesions, and particularly these are the vessels where calcium, you can see the mark, you do IVAS, you see the white shadow on OCT, you are clearly demarcated, so we know exactly how to uh, identify the severe calcium. And the treatment is very important because otherwise your stent may not be delivered or would not expand, will cause dissection. So treatment of the calcific lesion has been a challenging for interventionalists. Uh, we have various uh, devices just besides the balloon, cutting balloon, and atherectomy, laser rotational and orbital atherectomy. So one, the, the trial was just presented last week in TCT, the prepare calcium, uh, the randomized trial of the rotational atherectomy uh, to the cutting balloon in these patients, high speed rotational therectomy versus scoring balloon, and uh, to see the outcome of about, and, and of course, uh, the, uh, all these patients have a serolimus eluting or zero stent with a nine month and uh, angiographic follow up and uh, one year uh, clinical follow up. What happened is if you use a cutting balloon only in this calcific lesion, there was a crossover of 16% for various regions because uh, could not get uh, the with the balloon, stent, and so. So rotation atherectomy, 
from the acute outcome point of view did much better. 98% strategy success versus 81%. But then if you go to the more important end point that does it really make sense or improves the outcome at follow up to little disappointment, the late human loss was identical. And of course, so also the, the individual end point of the death MI and TVR, although it seems to be in rotablation slightly lower, but it not, did not make any statistical significance in this small 200 patient trial. So it seems to be that prepare a rotational therapy in the trial showed better outcome shortly, but not on the long term. The, we actually have our experience of 1,000 plus cases, which is accepted in Euro intervention, comparing two atherectomy techniques of the rotational atherectomy with the orbital atherectomy, and then we actually have OCT analysis, and basically showed that overall, you get little lesser complication with the rotational atherectomy in terms of uh, perforation, dissections, and so, uh, but at the long term, with the unadjusted, because same, as mentioned about it, very important with the patient's uh, characteristics, the unadjusted patients of rotational atherectomy were sicker, much higher in baseline risk factor, or the outcome seems to be uh, ten, trended towards uh, in favor of orbital with the unadjusted, but once you adjust, this dis, uh, difference almost disappeared. So I would say that rotational atherectomy and orbital were equal. With one thing, with, I would still say that orbital atherectomy somehow has a lower restenosis, but acutely rotational atherectomy has a lower complication. With the OCT stent analysis, so we could not find any region that why there should be a difference in the outcome because initial baseline as well as follow-up area was similar with two techniques. Then imaging studies, so various of the imaging studies, which is the angiography, uh, this is OCT, the M IVAS, we talked about the lumen four and six millimeter, and of course the near red, uh, near red spectroscopy, which is not available now. Uh, and then of course the FFR in the FAME one and two trial, and now the IFR uh, are the various imaging studies which we use in the cath lab. So now the various studies have kind of emphasize that maybe imaging is better, where the imaging guided PCI is better than angiographic guided PCI. This is the latest data from the, um, from the London Pen Registry. Uh, all patients, 12.6% had IVAS, 1.3% had OCT at follow-up, and we basically showed that at 30 day, by using these imaging technique, this is the angiography only, but that's a large number of patients, IVAS in about 13%, 0.4% mortality, 0.7 here, and 0.3 with the OCT. Again, very small number. You will say, maybe these were the simple straightforward cases. You did the imaging. But what are the data are published in Jack Intervention showing that imaging caused lower mortality, and more importantly, at follow-up overall MACE rate and, and mortality were lower in the imaging guided, particularly OCT, 7.7. 12.2 with the IVAS and 15.7 with the NGO guided. So it seems to be that no matter how you can compare, but this is so disparate number of patients, I don't know whether you really can make a meaningful comparison, but seems to be that imaging, particularly OCT, caused lower mortality. Uh, and uh, not much difference in OCT versus IVAS, but definitely with the OCT and angiography at five-year follow-up, lower all-cause mortality. So now there's another paper, uh, study presented uh, again uh, last month, uh, last week actually, uh, in TCT called Ultimate. There's a patient, I was guided PCI at the DES 720 large study of 1,500 kind of patient. I was guidance was the angiography guidance uh, PCI with a 12 month, uh, 12 month uh, follow up and published in Jack, uh, showed that using I was, you get a better lumen because you use multiple balloons and so on, so and so forth. So lumen gets better by using IVAS and it translated, uh, except that it requires extra time, more dye and extra time, but that's okay. But what happens at the long term? Long term showed that lower restenosis 2.9% versus 5.4%. No difference in other endpoints of the MI or death, but if you combine all, of course it's in favor of uh, IVAS guidance versus uh, angiographic guidance and decrease, numerical decrease in stent thrombosis from 0.7 to 0.1. So clearly it seems to be that I was as a routine time of PCI 
have a lower, uh, better outcome by decreasing the uh, re-stenosis and uh, numerically lower extent thrombosis and so. So there's another trial which is ongoing, actually another large trial of 2,500, uh, one of our fellow who is at Columbia now, Zayad Ali, which is the ILUMIN-4 uh, trial of the complex patients, high-risk clinical or lesion characteristics, those are the patients, bifurcation, instant stenosis, multiple stents, OCT-guided PCI versus angiography-guided PCI. This, will, this trial, I would say, will be the landmark trial to answer the question whether imaging helps uh, in improving the outcome of PCI and OCT in particular. Now, FFR, uh, as uh, Dr. Narul earlier mentioned, that uh, FFR FAME 2 trial, we have data one year, two year, and recently by five years, clearly showing that M the PCI guided, uh, FFR guided PCI has a very good outcome, similar to the registry. That means no PCI was done because FFR was more than 0.8. But if you do a medical therapy, then it's a real trouble. Uh, so clearly established that patients with FFR of less than 0.8 should get a PCI with a five-year outcome. Similar data we have for the FAME uh, and the DEFER trial. Then the bifurcation lesion intervention always has been a problem because we have so many techniques uh, for the bifurcation uh, when you have lesion uh, involving the branch, uh, the treatment is very different, very difficult. So many algorithms uh, which are, have been suggested that this technique is better versus that technique. So that led to um, the development of the bifurcate app. So clearly that now your science coming into uh, a simple way, app so that you can use it and this a uh, lot of work by, done by Dr. Keeney as with the fellows, two of them, Samit Bateja and uh, Surabhi uh, Chimaria, our earlier fellows, and it goes through step by step. Teaching the interventionalist, you start, the start point is the left main or no left main, and then you go to various techniques based on the stability, what is your size, uh, size vessel, what is the angulation, what technique you want to use, and really, Go, helps the interventionalist. I give you one example. This is the case uh, had an angiogram. Now you see the left main lesion here. So clearly we have said that if you have left main bifurcation lesion, you need two stent technique. So now the, this is on the this is a live case done which we do uh, every month. So while we are doing on the left side uh, procedure and angiogram, the right sub picture will tell you what is being done. Balloon here and the the atherotomy here. Uh, then you put a stent, clearly shown by the same, the stent dilated, then you are dilating the balloon in the main vessel, crushing the stent, and then you go back and dilate again. This is a DK crush technique, simultaneous. Now you brought another stent into the main vessel, the dilate the stent in the main vessel, then you go through it, do a kissing balloon dilatation in both the branches, and then come up with the final angiographic results. So clearly, the step-by-step, step, which can be put into the cath lab uh, and uh, for everyone. So this has been a great success. Um, the free download with the App Store as well as Google. Uh, and at present, the whole concept, which they really uh, took it to the cardiovascular education uh, with the various steps, how it was finally created, uh, was accepted to be published in Jack coming out in November issue. So really very innovative. At present, it's over more than 8,000 downloads uh, of this uh, device. So has been a great, I would say, educational tool uh, coming out from our cat lab. Then the newer DES and drug-coated balloon trial, the talent and basket small. The talent trial is the ultra-thin strut bio polymer, which is made in India. Uh, large number of uh, the patient trial uh, with the 1400 so supraflex cerulimus eluting stent against Zions, which is our uh, Abbott um, standard stent. And they compared uh, and presented data last week in TCT that although flexibility point of view, Zions was superior, 99.5% uh, device success versus 97.6, uh, and same also the procedural success, no difference in the uh, complications. And at follow up, uh, of uh, one year, both remain identical. So just to say the large, uh, the new stent, which is, will be much cheaper, because anything manufactured there, we actually knew uh, heart valves being manufactured will be one third, one fourth price of 
what we use here, same thing will be the stent. Our usual stents are about 1,000, and this uh, stent will be available for maybe uh, the $200. But key is the overall outcome were identical. Only thing they could not understand, there was a significantly higher rate of death, seven patients versus two patients uh, in the uh, supraflex group. Uh, they are identifying, going through step by step, that why that was a difference, but overall, uh, extent, uh, present, the data presented last week was very, very promising. So then, what about the using a drug-coated balloon for the small coronary artery? Because small arteries, you have much, not much option. You can put a stent, which we do all the time, and many other studies have been done, and the, the drug-coated balloon have been used in coronary arteries uh, quite a bit. But this trial, basket small, compare the drug-coated balloon with a DES. So initial DES was the Texas, then of course it changed to a ever luting stent, so drug-coated balloon against drug-luting stent, and basically found that um, overall outcome, the lower one, the outcome is uh, the, the drug-coated balloon, and uh, is the stent on the top. So seems to be MI target reverse revascularization was numerically lower, and again, it's a little un unexplained, little higher death uh, with the drug-coated balloon. So basically, message was the drug-coated balloon was non-inferior to DES in small vessels. So another issue always comes, patient is elderly, what do you do? Should you put a bare metal stent or should you do DES? Should you put a DES, then do you give antiplatelet therapy or one month, six months, or 12 months? The senior trial, again, large number of patients, about 1,200 plus, they actually have either one month, both. They tried bare metal or the DES, synergy stent, and gave one month of uh, a DAP patient in stable CAD and patient unstable six months in both the groups. So basically it was a one month versus six months in both the groups, BMS versus DES, and basically found that DES, despite many of them giving a one month, has superior than bare metal. So clearly bare metal is out even in elderly patients and uh, short duration is of uh, the antiplatelet therapy is okay because very low stent thrombosis as shown here. That was a numerical number. Then unprotected left main, we know the trials have been done with the uh, Excel trials and so there's still this field continue to get some additional data. The second, the one data came in 2018 from Park. I would say the maximum number of left main is, studies or stents are done in, uh, from South Korea and that's where actually the whole field evolved. Uh, because their uh, majority of the left main patients undergo uh, stenting. And so the, basically they compared various stents which we have types and it seems to be that except the platinum chromium uh, type stent which has a higher event rate, the most of the stents were identical. So it basically seems to be their conclusion that more, most of the second generation stents are identical. We know Excel trial was done by the Zions, but other stents uh, could be comparable. Uh, then and another meta-analysis showing of all the published trial, Excel, Nobel, Lehman's, pre-combat, and syntax, showing that identical death, MI, and stroke uh, as such. Of course, we know once you go to a high syntax score, cabbage is superior uh, to DES, and of course, the higher revascularization with the PCI, uh, with, the, uh, with the PCI compared to cabbage, uh, and so. So clearly, this field, I would say, overall, the, while there seems to be a difference in cabbage, really favored in patients with multivessel disease. In the in the cabbage, in in the in left main, actually the PCI is doing a quite well, and so. So then, antiplatelet therapy switch and duration. So clearly, issues. Remember that now we have made six months uh, recommendation of the DAPT uh, in the stable patients and 12 months in acute coronary syndrome patient. And we also know that we have a stronger. P2Y12 inhibitor, presagrol, and uh, tricagrelor, which are more efficacious than clopidogrel, but at a cost of higher bleeding rate. And therefore, uh, th these are class one indications, but truly, studies have shown that you use them in barely 20, 25% of cases. Why? Because we are worried about bleeding, not that much thrombosis at present. So many studies have done that, what if you give one month only? One month, and after that you change, continue with your, pre your a stronger P2Y12 compared to uh, switch uh, to clopidogrel. And seems to be that once you switch, you do a better outcome because you have lower bleeding. So there seems to be a momentum going on that maybe 
It's advisable to change newer P2Y inhibitor to clopidogrel after one month and no loading. Uh, then there is an expert consensus about switching. And this part of that was shown by Dr. Bates of the various agents which we have work on a various pathways. And now the switching, that what should be the best way, what dose should be for the switch, they really have put in a very nice algorithm that anytime you use the newer agents, stronger, they do have a better efficacy, but it's, it, many times you may need to switch and they give a guideline. Basically that if you're early phase versus late phase, and early phase means within 30 days, 30 days you want to switch one agent versus other, you have to give the loading dose. And if after that probably loading dose can be avoided. And of course, uh, bridge, patient who is getting surgery also very well shown here. Then the radial intervention, we all know the matrix, the radial has been a superior compared to femoral in many trials. The another paper, uh, matrix trial with a one year outcome showing the femoral uh, the, uh, of 17.2, uh, may NACE versus 15.2 uh, in the radial superiority and clearly the benefit occurs in early time period and largely because of the lower uh, the mor mortality and trend towards lower myocardial infarction and significantly lower bleeding. Now also the matrix trial showed that if you have bivalutin versus heparin, the event, the outcome were identical. So then go to a multivessel PCI in cardiogenic shock, which is a culprit shock trial. As you know, the lot of data in patient with a multivessel PCI in acute MI, STEMI, the favor, many trials have shown that do all many vessels possible, but it seems to be that in shock trial, this is strategy of uh, using a multi-vessel PCI, that patient has a multi-vessel disease, we were taught in the past that try to open as many arteries possible in patient who is in shock. And we have one year data that if you do the culprit vessel versus multi-vessel, the culprit vessel has a better outcome uh, compared to multi-vessel and if you use the renal replacement therapy or just the mortality. And this is one year data uh, sustained that seems to be that culprit lesion PCI in patient shock is what is recommended and it's a better strategy. And of course the difference is basically the first 30 days. Individual endpoints were much different also. So this is changing the guideline. That in shock patient, what we used to say almost one class one to two indication in the past that you do a multivessel PCI, now it's showing that it's a class three, do only culprit vessel PCI. So last, I would say, uh, advancement in my opinion for, uh, for our interventional cardiology is the role of aspirin or aspirin duration. I'm not talking about a lot of uh, publication and reports last month about aspirin not good in primary prevention, diabetic patients, and so on and so forth. So this basically has been the issue that uh, patient uh, ischemic benefits versus bleeding, and of course, uh, particularly patients who have received the uh, stent the dual antiplatelet therapy is given for some duration of time, whether three months, six months, 12 months or above. And uh, there has been an issue that maybe we can abbreviate the duration of DAP to three months to 30 months. So that led to six months in the stable patients and 12 months to uh, in unstable patient uh, PCI, that was the recommendation. So what if it's the aspirin which is giving a trouble? So there are two trials going to the, uh, answer that question, one of them uh, which I'm going to discuss, other one will be available next year. That is the give aspirin for one month and continue ticagrelor 24 months versus aspirin for three months and you give ticagrelor for 15 months, which is the twilight trial. So what I wanted to show is because ticagrelor is a potent antiplatelet therapy, why don't you give it as a single antiplatelet therapy? And that was looked into the global leaders trial. These are the patients, all types, uh, the, with the primary endpoint of a death, MI, and uh, stent thrombosis. So what happened is patients who were stable CAD got aspirin for one month, ticagrelor for 24 months. The patients who are acute coronary syndrome got aspirin for 24 months, ticagrelor for, uh, for one year. Uh, and uh, and the, of course, our usual strategy of the clopidogrel given for uh, 12 months with aspirin 24 months. So this basically is strategy what we usually do here, but now this was, let's try giving aspirin only for one month and see what happens. And of course, the primary out outcome uh, the shown here. So basically, this is the reference arm, this is the experimental arm, which is the monotherapy. So it was lower, but numerically, 
did not make, I mean, numerically lower, but did not make a p-value significance, as you can see here. And in, in terms of the bleeding, that of course, this is the strategy of the uh, monotherapy, for, uh, slightly numerically lower, but did not make any difference. So people felt that it's a negative trial. Negative trial in the sense, to me, I would say a difference. Yeah, the trial may not have met the end point, but it really has opened the, a, a very important door. And the door is that you can take away the aspirin and you did not increase the bleeding. And that's a very, very good message. So that is what we have been, always have the issue that what to do with a dual antiplatelet therapy. So clearly, that seems to be the withdrawing aspirin, in my opinion, has really led to the, which we have spoken so many times in our daily life, that maybe the aspirin is the culprit. So it's so, uh, and you did not increase the stent thrombosis. Why are we worried about aspirin withdrawal? Because we're concerned about that we'll have a higher stent thrombosis. And this global leaders trial showed, no, it does not increase. Maybe a numerically, the, you know, death, death, MI, and individual endpoints, which was shown uh, in the previous, uh, the, I think I can show the, yeah. So other individual endpoints, MI, all have been shown here. So numerically lower, but did not make a statistical significance. But from my point of view, it has basically has opened the door for newer, uh, I would say, much more research in this field that should, do you really need aspirin? I know Dr. Badiman had that question one time earlier also. What about monotherapy? So why you need? Because we were told you need double antiplatelet therapy. So maybe you don't need double antiplatelet therapy. Uh, and so, so this uh, really, the negative trial, maybe, I would say, but uh, I, from my point of view, it's a positive in the sense that it really opened up a door. So what they say, ticagrelor in combination with aspirin for one month, followed by ticagrelor alone for 23 months, was not superior to a routine strategy. And clearly, yes, yeah, okay, but it was not associated with any higher event rate, numerically lower bleeding. So this is the overall message from this. Now then, which really goes to the twilight trial, and that is the complex PCI, a trial being done, a trial has completed, Roxana Mehran, the PI, the patients, after the complex PCI, which is defined, they get, everybody gets the ticagrelor 90 milligram twice a day, aspirin 81 milligram, and after three months, aspirin is dropped off. Everybody continue ticagrelor for another 12 months, and one group gets aspirin, other group gets nothing. So this will, to me, will be another big winner if we can show that by this strategy, we do not increase the stent thrombosis, but at the same time, we decrease the bleeding. So it will be a very remarkable, uh, the trial has done and uh, likely to be presented next year, either in TCT or AHA 2019 uh, and so. So this, with the real, uh, I would put together uh, these uh, advances in our interventional cardiology, which have moved the field uh, to do something or not to do something, just like culprit shock and so. So which I put it here, that uh, change in clinical practice. So multi-vessel PCI in cardiogenic shock, bivalvulin PCI, not necessary. Save the money and of course save the time with multi-vessel PCI. Bifurcate app, rotational threat mean calcific lesion PCI, unprotected left main PCI, just plus. I mean, plus minus you could say, but uh, overall definitely add on to our interventional cardiology knowledge. Swap, drug-coated balloon in small vessels, one month of aspirin plus ticagrelor based on the global leaders, very good. Good, positive change in our practice. Then I was guided PCI, transradial PCI, uh, intravascular brachytherapy for the re DSISR, absolutely plus, plus, plus to change our clinical practice and to make us a better interventionist. And that is what we do now. Overall, complication rate, just so I put it together for Sinai, uh, for these are the deaths, uh, all in hospital deaths, urgent cabbage, MI, all together remain less than 0.1%. And this is uh, comparison, last report we have from 2015 uh, from the New York State. This is the data, your double star means your 30-day um, risk-adjusted mortality is lower than the statewide average, and consistently, we have received that double star in one or two uh, categories. Uh, uh, and of course, these are the various volume of the various hospitals. Uh, this was a year combined uh, and uh, the three year combined and 2015 was the previous slide. And also uh, the readmission, 
the now it has become a big issue just same thing like for the heart failure mi patients with the pci also readmission uh, and so so our again double star means lower than statistical uh, statistically lower than the statewide average uh, clearly we continue to progress the field and teach uh, others what we do here getting the good outcome by our monthly webcast of the ccc live cases uh, uh, and uh, the peripheral interventions and the, now the structural heart every other uh, month. And you will be happy to see it's about eight to 10,000 hits per month in 138 countries. The top is um, America, second is India, third is England. So these are the three, clearly the, each our episode is seen by 10,000, nine to 10,000 people uh, so you get a little more spike once we have a little more complications or some other interesting case and so, but otherwise uh, has been a great, great educational experience. Uh, and uh, this time we actually doing another, knowing that the VAL is the important separate dedicated VAL conference. So beside the June, I st we do a coronary and structural combine. I'm dissociating the structural and we'll have a dedicated structural on December 6th, the New York uh, VAL uh, transcatheter VAL. Uh, uh, conference. So with that note, I'll stop here uh, and thank you very much. And I can take any questions. And here, Jeanette can come here meanwhile uh, if we get for the raffle. <laughs> okay. Uh, radial artery access in multiple cath, sacrificing in uh, case cabbage needed, real artery transplanting in cabbage. Actually, you know, that's uh, one of the issue uh, has been uh, the many centers, particularly, let's say, in India. They use radial artery in majority, and then question comes, uh, you, a patient needs surgery, and there are data that by doing a radial artery technique, we do uh, cause the injury to the radial artery, and there are actually papers also, uh, and so. So key is that uh, the, and most of the time, Right, let's say Dr. Puskas will use the left radial, right? Le the, you will use right and left radial uh, rarely, but mostly it's the left radial. So try to do uh, cases from the right radial, and the right radial can be punctured again. So the question comes like femoral, you can puncture. So right radial, I had a patient yesterday, I uh, had a little trouble post PCI, some chest pain. So we just went, uh, four hour later patient had, we had taken the, uh, the radial band because procedure was done about five hours ago, had some chest pain, and just went one centimeter above. So radial artery can be repunctured acutely or further on, except the, if the radial artery occludes. The radial artery occlusion, which used to be almost eight, 10 percent, now most of the data by various techniques giving heparin and the patent hemostasis, it has decreased to about two percent. So as long as the radial is good, uh, it's uh, okay. But I'm sure the catheterization to the radial artery and if it's ultimately going to be used as a conduit based on the data uh, is it definitely is uh, affects it. Okay, with that note, uh, Jagat, you want to come up here? <laughs> okay, we're going to read the last three numbers. The first, starting with 485. No? Okay. 490. All right, let's go to the next one. Six zero three. Left the building. You like it, huh? All right. Four nine seven. All right. Four nine seven. Because they actually but the clock then two hundred and forty two people. Where are they? Okay. 
four seven zero. You got it. Okay. The search ends. So the Yale University gets it, huh? Yes. Good. Okay, with that note, uh, we conclude our uh, today's top 10 uh, topics in cardiology and of course, uh, uh, the next year date will be announced soon. Uh, thank you for coming and all these lectures will be sent to you by email, means uh, it will be, you will be able to access this by Monday, all the lectures you can download. All the slides, all the lectures you'll be able to download uh, for your future use. And thank you very much and thanks all our faculty to uh, for the great and, yeah. and, and yeah people could watch it on the YouTube also yes <laughs>